It's time for Twig this week in Google. We've got, of course, Paris Martineau. Jeff Jarvis is back from his testimony in front of Congress. And Glenn Fleischman joins us in studio. Great to have Glenn here. We'll talk about all kinds of things, some, some stuff Google's getting rid of, including my theory that Google's about to get rid of the Pixel phone. Google's endorsing the right to repair. What? And big layoffs inside Google. And now Google Maps supports tunnels. All that and a whole lot more coming up next. On Twig. This show is brought to you by Cisco Meraki. Without a cloud managed network, businesses inevitably fall behind. Experience the ease and efficiency of Meraki's single platform to elevate the place where your employees and customers come together. Cisco Meraki maximizes uptime and minimizes loss to digitally transform your organization. Meraki's intuitive interface, increased connectivity, and multi site management keep your organization operating seamlessly and securely wherever you're team is. Let Cisco Meraki's 24-7 available support help your organization's remote, on-site, and hybrid teams always do their best work. Visit meraki.cisco.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. twit. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 751, recorded Wednesday, January 17th, 2024. The numtot with a top knot. This Week in Google is brought to you by Miro. Miro is one incredible visual place that brings all of your innovative work together, no matter where you're located. In fact, Miro's great for teams distributed all over the world in all different time zones. And man, Miro can work with all kinds of assignments. We're talking six whole capabilities bundles from uh, product development workflows to content visualization and more. It's powered by Miro AI which means you're instantly generating new ideas or summarizing complex information. And Miro connects seamlessly to platforms you're already using, like Jira and Confluence and Google or Asana. We use it with Zapier. You can centralize your work in a way that makes sense for your team. And here's the beauty part. They don't have to leave Miro to update projects or statuses using any of these tools. You could do it all in Miro. Miro users, it's so efficient. Miro users report saving up to 80 hours a year by streamlining conversations, cutting down on meetings, and seeing all the most up-to-date information in one place. It's a perfect kind of reference for anything you're working on. So everybody's on the same page, literally. Miro has a board video recording feature now called TalkTrack. This is a great way to, without having another meeting, give your feedback. You can record a video, leave it right on the board, right where it matters, and you don't have to schedule another meeting. That is a big time saver all by itself. Look, you got to try it for yourself. Your first three boards are free. Start working better. Miro.com slash podcast. That's M-I-R-O dot com slash podcast. It's time for Twig this week in Google, the show we cover the latest news from the Googleverse and the AI-verse. And this is in reverse-verse because I'm in... Rhode Island, visiting my mom. But lo and behold, look who's in the studio sitting in my chair, Glenn Fleischman. Hello, Glenn. Hello. Hmm. I've, I've staged a takeover. You have. You need that Snoopy in your lap, and you could be <laughs> Ernst Stavro Blofeld, Doctor Evil. <laughs> so, Glenn, I it came out. You came out to see uh, the Snoopy Museum, the Charles Schultz Museum. Yeah, I'm doing some research and got a got a. Get the nickel tour and look at old comics. Somehow part of my living is looking at old comics, which is, uh, I don't know how I did it, but I'm going with it. It's a good thing. <laughs> and and it, it's because of your book, uh, mainly? or Yeah, I've got a, I've got a book that I hope is going to go to Kickstarter next month called uh, How Comics Were Made. How Comics Were Made. Inc. I -N -K, and it's uh, about the history of newspaper comics uh, production and reproduction. So I was looking at... Uh, the Schultz Museum has uh, all the archives of um, everything created by Charles Schultz during his lifetime. And oh, wow. so I was looking at old strips and color guides where they mark things up for Sunday pages and printed versions of the strips and plates and, you know, my favorite flongs. There's a flong on the screen at the moment. 
uh, printing plates. And um, it's just talking generally with the folks there about like just the practicalities because they're a giant licensing organization and um, they're very well disposed to my project. And they've been very, very nice about it. So, Oh, good. I'm glad to, uh, to hear it. Put a lot of peanut stuff in there along with, uh, you know, Doonesbury and um, Yellow Kid and all kinds of stuff across comics history. Did the you Yellow Kid do was... geeky things okay. about how they did it? Yeah, which parts of the geeky? Well, they, they actually don't know many of the geeky things because printing is kind of not part of right. cartooning. It's this weird kind of art where you're like, well, I drew a thing and then I'm totally disconnected from the rest of the process. And um, How would they get it to the printer? Would they mail it? Yeah, they would send, uh, like, you know, artists would, if they were near New York, they'd courier it in. And if they were wow. further away, they'd just, you know, bundle it up and, and put it in express post and hope it wasn't destroyed wow. by the mail. There were actually nice. some comics on a, a plane that was hijacked and blown up. And um, oh my God. there's a story about that from, I think, the Lockerbie one where the original cartoon, I mean, like, oh, that's, yeah. that's the least worry of what was lost, of course. Not well, lots, yeah, but, of course. But, um, but yeah, still. they're just, they're a piece of, until scanning uh, became a thing, um, some artists actually fax their cartoons at a whopping, you know, 197 DPI. They'd make them oversize and scan them. And those ran in wow. newspapers also somehow. Wow. Terrible. What a story. Yeah. Uh, also with us, of course, Paris Martineau from uh, beautiful downtown New York, which for the first time in two years has had snowfall. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm living the dream, but it sounds like Glenn is living the dream. Yeah, truly. he's living the Daydream. snow free dream. Yeah. Yeah. Paris reports for the information and uh, is uh, a, an expert on sneaky, the sneaky ways of Silicon Valley. Yes, sir. <laughs> we have a superstar amongst us now. You, I, you saw him last week testifying for the United States Senate the subcommittee. You had to beg him to come back to our little show. Well, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually unhappy because you didn't play any of my testimony. You got no, bored did. quickly by Blumenthal. I listened to the whole show. Oh no, we played uh, we played your opening statement. You did? Yeah. I didn't hear it oh, on the Oh, maybe that was before the show then. Was that Cuz we definitely listened to about 10 Oh yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank eight. you very much. Well, that was an oversight on my part. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I apologize. <laughs> I put on yeah, a no, tie. You know, cuz it was quite it was quite eloquent. I thought we had You looked that, great. I thought we had it in the show. I really did. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> That was just an uh, oversight on my part. Kathy was figured... nice enough to note the, the my my main statement, which made, which made me happy. But then I, I would listen to the whole show thinking, no, they're going to oh, play me. They didn't I'm so play sorry. me. I was so sad. Shoot. I missed you guys last week. Well, you did a great job, and you represented uh, you. us all very well. And we did put a link in there uh, for people who so they could see it. Gosh. Whoever was watching before the show watched us watch almost, I believe, I think your entire statement and then comment on it beforehand. But I guess we forgot to put that in the <laughs> I, actual podcast. Unbelievable. This that's... is what happens when you leave us, Jeff. Everything uh, I know. goes haywire. I know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's actually some scary stuff that came out of it because they want to screw up fair use and make oh, everything no. that AI uses licensed and paid for. Well, and that. Messes Kathy Gellis was on the show last yep. week, and she really talked about the right to read and well, how she was great. doing this is well. Yeah, you heard the show. It's going to it really is going to cause major problems for the First Amendment, uh, among other things. So, um, yeah, and I'm more and more inclined to just say let just let AI eat whatever it wants, um, and we'll deal with the consequences later. <laughs> well, you guys discussed this too. It was interesting the the, the separation between um, training and output. And Roger Lynch, who's the CEO of Cutting Nest, kept on saying training and outlet, training and outlet, but he put them together. And he said, whichever, any use, you should license yeah, no, and pay, that's which BS. is ridiculous because yeah, it's BS. a transformative use. It's fair use. Blackburn went after me saying, you want to expand fair use? So, well, I want an expansive use of fair use, yes. And then at the end- You don't uh, have Blumenthal, to expand fair use. It I protects to, I want it. to protect it. Yeah. And then Blumenthal said, well, if fair use takes over everything, then copyright's dead. Whether they're doing the actual opposite, they're going to shrink fair use to the point that copyright's dead. But Well, that brings us to uh, the article in The New Yorker uh, this week, which I thought was uh, quite interesting uh, and provocative. I don't know if you guys had a chance uh, to read it yet. I've used up my monthly articles. <laughs> I know. I'm always nervous about uh, putting... Uh... Anyway, is AI the death of IP? Uh, Louis Menand is writing. Oh yeah, I'm I'm running. Now I haven't run out because I pay for the New Yorker, but for some reason I can never log in on the website, so I have to use it on the um, 
uh, on the app, on the phone, which is no good. Anyway, uh, I think a, a, an interesting piece in which he argues that um, generative AI, you know, basically people are going to be attempting to, in effect, extend copyright even farther than it deserves to be. Already it's overextended, I think he's, he believes, and I think that's correct. And uh, that this, this fight against AI is just really... And I think Cory Doctorow has said this as well. Uh, copyright these days isn't about protecting an author. It's not protecting you, Paris, or protecting uh, Jeff or you, Glenn. It's really about the big companies who own the rights. You know, Sony that bought the entire rights to Bruce Springsteen's catalog. It's to protect them. It's to protect their rent-seeking. Which and was the case at the very beginning of copyright. Except it was a much shorter term in the very beginning. In 1710, right? in Statute of Anne, it was not creators, it was booksellers and publishers who demanded copyright to try to control and create a tradable asset. Um, but interestingly, the New York Times said in their suit against OpenAI, we've always been protected by copyright. No, they were not protected until 1909. It was intended only to protect in the U.S. books and maps and charts. Did not include magazines, did not include newspapers. Didn't and even when it started... Didn't include um, film. Didn't include moving images or pictures, no. right? No. Well, and that's um, a good example. And that's one of the things that Menon says uh, in his piece is that there's always radio uh, attempted to, to, you know, protect. Uh, let's see. What, let me see if I can find the paragraph in here. But, the, but the, that's exactly what happened. Photography was seen as an assault on copyright. And then radio was seen as an assault on copyright. Yes. And then video was seen as an assault. So every time a new technology comes along, um, there is this kind but of. My, adjustment. My question, though, is, and let's, I mean, not to, I love fair use. My, my book, my book on comics is heavily leaning on uh, the vagaries of copyright law so that things are in the public domain, on fair use and so forth. I love it. I love it. And I also love when my work is protected in specific ways for me to have limited exploitation rights of it. But my question is, how do you ingest it legally? What I know that Google Books set some precedent for scanning materials you don't have the rights to uh, uh, yeah, they won that case, by right? The way. So, what yeah. is the legality? How do you get the entire New York Times corpus if it proves through courts or laws to be legal to ingest that as part of your AI corpus? I mean, it's being distributed. The corpus is being distributed in a way that I don't think that uh, those what L five sets. I can't remember the name of it. The giant learning sets. Like, there's material in the learning sets that should be considered a copyright violation because of how they're disseminated even if it's legal to ingest it. So I think there's some fine points there that have not actually been dealt with uh, about, you know, you can transform work, but you have to acquire the work. You have to rip every DVD. And then how do you distribute that? If it's for your own purposes, there's one set of rules per Google Books. Uh, but if you're distributing it in learning sets, then it's a whole, in a way that uh, maybe even can't be reconstructed, but that's in a way that's, uh, you know, extracted it from the original media. I think there's a big issue there. You're, you're right, Glenn, and, and I think books three, no one can argue, was acquired uh, properly. Uh, but um, common uh, crawl, crawls the open web. Though, as I mentioned in my testimony, New York Times is demanding their stuff be taken down. And uh, I talked today to a guy named Will Slaughter, who's brilliant. He wrote a, the book, um, Who Owns the News? It's a really good exploration of copyright. Um, he's in Paris. And um, he said that, that he thinks that the, the Google Books uh, settlement in the end creates a model here where you can ingest things, but then you can limit the output of it. You can use it. You can learn from it. You can create a corpus that you can deal with. But then when it comes to delivering it to someone, if you don't have the rights to do so, then you can't. Then you come up with it. Then, oh. then there's a deal that gets made. Either, either somebody pays or you're prohibited from doing it or whatever. But if you look at how Google Books operates, you get a little sample, you can't print it out, you can't download a PDF if it's not uh, in, in um, oh, but same with the Hathi Trust, which I use all the time. Yeah, it's a great. So the, the Manon piece is really a, kind of a quasi review of a new book called Who Owns This Sentence? A History of Copyrights and Wrongs by David Bellos and Alexander uh, Montague. And and really the, the point is, uh, the rights to, a, he says, I'm reading from uh, the article, to a vast amount of created material, movies, music, books, art, games, computer software, scholarly article, articles, just about any cultural product people will pay to consume are increasingly owned by a small number of large corporations. And because of 
these extensions that the U.S. Congress has put through, they're not going to expire for probably till we're gone. For instance, right. you know, I mean, most of us will be long gone uh, because it's now what is it, life plus ninety five, or life plus seventy five? Um, if it's a corporation, it's it's longer. <laughs> yeah, we're since nineteen seventy eight. It's it's seventy years from the death of the creator. But for corporate authors, which is companies that pay employees to make stuff, it's ninety five years from the date of publication, or a hundred twenty years from the date of creation, whichever is shorter. Well, you know, there's actually a work by not to get too far afield by John Adams that is still under copyright. Because it was unpub it was unpublished until a point in ah. I, I want to say the fifties or seventies, uh. and in t and because of the laws of that time, because it was unpublished right. when it was published, that's when the copyright started on it. <laughs> so it's not it's going to be under copyright. I think it's like twenty fifty will be the last thing from the founding fathers that uh, goes into the public domain. That seems a little ridiculous. Who is possibly. considered the owner of that at this point? Well, there are estates, and it's you know it, 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 that's the thing is there's the whole orphan works thing. And in this case, there is a chain of ownership of of John Adams' estates and his literary work. And so there are actually people considered to be owners of John Adams' words. And so even though, you know, his all the rest of his copyright expired long ago, there are still folks who are the authorized representatives. Not so this, and this is what we I harped on last week, so I don't want to reiterate it, but there is a... Uh, and, and the reason that patents and copyrights and trademarks all exist is because to balance the right of the creator, of the property holder with the rights of society as a whole. And the whole premise initially was, well, you give the creator some time to recoup, to make some money on the creation, but sooner than later, like I think it was originally 17 years or something, the, the public domain gets it so that we can all create on it. And he, he Manon especially points out music. He says there is, there's a lot of copying in music. That's how music works. Popular music styles are defined by the chords they use and there are a limited number of them uh and so there have been some really ridiculous uh, cases ed sheeran most recently won his case by winning over the jury by he was being uh sued for copying a marvin Gaye song uh last spring during the trial he got on the witness stand and played his guitar and demonstrated to the jury that the four chord progression in his song was common in pop music that there are all these other songs that uses four chord progression. You can't, you can't steal it from Marvin Gaye because it's it's part of pop music. Uh, now he won, but uh, but there have been a lot of cases like George Harrison's uh, lawsuit that George Harrison lost. It cost George Harrison a lot of money because uh, the Chiffons sued. He had to pay five hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars to them for "My Sweet Lord." Um, it's, it's, so this is the question. And I think that this really applies to AI. Uh, don't we have a societal interest in letting AI learn? Uh, as, as, uh, as, uh, Sam Altman pointed out, uh, in, in the lawsuit against the New York times, if you say on, you know, open AI can only learn from non copyright materials, you're not going to get a very good AI out of it. Well, there's an issue it's, about it's the commercial exploitation, though. If you look at the fair use test, is if AI can be created that I mean, and this I'm saying I'm not saying well, this there's is four tests. Right, four One tests. is transformative, right. right? It and so you can say it's transformative, right? You don't have to. You don't have to pass all four. No, right? absolutely. It can be transformative. It can have, it can be de minimis or have no effect on commercial exploitation of the work. Uh, it can be for largely ed educational or critical purposes. So all that's true. But, you know, I guess this, I don't have an answer for this. But my question is, and I think some of the authors involved in one of the lawsuits say, if I punch in like a Michael Chabon and I say, uh, uh, you know, write this Michael Chabon novel and it produces an exact copy, like that doesn't seem- But it doesn't. Transformative. Well- Right, but you can get right. I mean, it doesn't. But would it? And the New York the Times had to really jump through hoops to get right in their lawsuit against uh, against a OpenAI to get it to quote the New York Times. They actually asked it to quote the New York Times. In effect, they gave it the first seven paragraphs of the article and said, "Now, what would you say? And I mean, what words are left in your entire corpus that are going to be uh, associated with these mm -hmm. next?" Yeah, I mean, was it was that, a ridiculous. Yeah. It's a ridiculous case. Uh, Manan points out in his article that it's. It, we just don't know how juries and judges are going to rule on this. You know, I think a lot of people think 
uh, as Kathy Gellis did last week, that they should rule in favor of societal expectations yep. instead of in favor of creators. But boy, creators are up in arms over this. Uh, Sarah Silverman's case was dis dismissed mostly. Most, most of it, right? Yeah. Uh, it. Grisham and Jody Picot are still out there, still suing. Well, well, Paris is our is our resident uh, high end creator here who who says, "Yeah, hold on, guys. What do you think this week, Paris? About I mean, I still think that I don't. I'm not sure that there is that we have a societal right to make better informed AI, especially when what we're talking about are increasingly commercial models. I'm not sure that some, uh, you know, greater right out there exists for us to give copyrighted work for free to these companies. I don't disagree with your guys' points about the right to read and how that would overwhelmingly, you know, impact uh, society in probably a, a net positive way, if you're right about kind of the way AI is going. But I'm I'm not sure that it is as cut and dry as we should just let all AI models have everything. I well, do. Yeah, also I have an extreme a, point of view on that. I mean, I really. Do I, I mean, it's because it, you took that walk with Sam Altman <laughs> yeah, it's of the and Jason walk. Kalanakis, yeah. and you've been radicalized. <laughs> he ever got since. Hit no time. I do. Uh, I was curious though, Jeff. Could you walk us a bit through uh, what your experience was like at um, oh, Senate Congress. Testifying? Yeah. Yeah. How oh. did you get invited to do this? Um, what was it like kind of behind the scenes being there? Sure. And did um, Marsha Blackburn senators... take you out to dinner? <laughs> yeah. Was there any good gossip? <laughs> uh, no. So so um, it was a staffer for Blumenthal who contacted me out of nowhere who said, we need somebody to testify at this hearing about AI and journalism. I was thinking about you anyway. And then I watched, said he, uh, a CBC interview I had done uh, oh. about, about all this. So he said, and, and so, but the truth is I was a beard. I was a beard for them. Yeah. So that they I could was have, afraid of that, frankly. Yes. They, were, they had a hearing that was about legislators and lobbyists in a love fest over the laws that they're writing together. Right. And so they were all going to nod at each other. And it wasn't really a hearing. If there wasn't somebody who said, uh, uh well, wait a minute. Yeah, no, they'd so already I, made up their the mind, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and and his only very nice young guy. And his only advice was, um, you know, th throw in some positive stuff here. So you're 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 arguing for the use, which I did. Um, but I knew what was going to happen. So so it starts off. I get there way early. I'm waiting outside the room. We go in. Uh, you know, it's at the table. It has the little uh, uh, microphone stand it, and, and it had a timer on it. I thought it was going to time me at five minutes. I cut mine down and down and down and down to get under five minutes for sure. They didn't turn the timer on in the end. Oh. Because um, it was, there was nobody there. There were only a total of six senators at various times mm. wow. out of the whole bunch. Uh, I don't know what it looked like on, on the camera. Now you and, can't tell that they're coming and going on the camera, exactly. of course. Yeah. Um, so I have the news, the NMA, the I guess it's whatever it's called now. It's the former uh, magazine organization, the former newspaper magazine that merged. So they're lobbyists now. The NAB, which is lobbyists, and the president of Connie Nast, Roger Lynch. And they all kind of like, oh, hi, because they'd all read my testimony. Huh. They knew. I was, mm. yeah. was going to yeah. disagree. So they were, they were cordial, of course, and I was cordial back, but it was like, no, we don't agree with you about anything. <clears throat> and then I knew what was going to happen. I could I could see it for the first minute is that it, it wasn't until I didn't speak till 40 minutes in. And uh, they all give their statements and then they ask the people they want to ask to get the answers they want to get. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So they ask the NMA person and oh, yes, yes, yes. They, do, they, they owe us a fortune. Do they owe you a fortune? Yes, they owe us a fortune. So that's what it is. Right. So then in comes. Uh, and, and Josh Hawley, who I was kind of dreading, uh, was actually very cordial and nice. Marsh, Marsha Blackburn marches in, and I put a time code to this in the in the rundown. She marches in uh, in the middle of. She's not been paying attention at all. She's been out. She comes in. Her staff obviously gave her. That's the liberal. So she goes <laughs> after me and says, um, uh, "Well, Mr. Jarvis, Professor Jarvis, uh, do you want to expand?" Uh, fair use. I said, well, I want to enforce fair use as it is. Uh, oh, and then she said, I'm from Nashville and I have a lot of creators there and they're really worried about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then she says, well, of course we know that media are liberal. You know, she's looking at me, right? And the AI is liberal, has a liberal bias too. <laughs> so does truth. <laughs> so then yeah. she says, then she says, um, 
If you go to ChatGPT and you ask it to write an admiring poem about Donald Trump, it will refuse. But if you go and ask it to write a poem about Joe Biden, it will. And if you go to the time code there, that is her reading this poem. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, From, you'll have to. Yeah, here you go. Go ahead and play that. We can. Well, it's OK. Oh, there doesn't sound any audio. Hold on. Sorry, I should have warned you. Wow. Well, normally I could do it, but I don't have admiring the Admiring poem about Joe Biden. A poem admiring President Trump. If you turn around and next you say, I want to write a poem, ask for a poem, <coughs> admiring Joe Biden. <laughs> Here's what you get. And I quote <laughs> Chat GPT. <laughs> Joe Biden, leader of the land, with a steady hand and heart of a man. You took the helm in troubled times with a message of unity. Your words of hope and empathy provide comfort to the nation. And it goes on and on. And here's a screenshot that I have for the record. So my question to you would be, is this type bias? acceptable in these training models, machine learning for AI? First, it's really bad poetry. Uh, so I think, I think maybe <laughs> perhaps President Trump is lucky not to have been so memorialized. Um, I, I think that if we try to get to a point of legislating fake versus not fake, true versus false, we end up in a very dangerous territory and similarly around bias. What all of these models do is reflect the biases of society. So I'll take you, as you say, that media are generally liberal, and thus what they ingest is going to be that way. I think it reflects the bias that is coming from what they're ingesting. My time has expired. Thank you all. Okay, you can Thanks, cut it off. Senator. Uh, Senator. And then she leaves. <laughs> yeah, she I leaves. Mean, job so, done. <laughs> it went around. But she, but she has a point. I mean, she, actually, she's, so you know what? She's right. I was going to say, I was very confused because I found myself saying, I don't think she's, I, wait, what? I think she might be. No, she's right. Yeah. I tried it right afterwards. And go to ChatGPT, it would not do it. And for Biden, it actually gave me the poem recited at his inauguration. Paris, oh, which is a beautiful poem. Did yeah. they stumble upon this bit of information? I oh, want some to know. staffer. Or it's the first some, thing they tried. <laughs> Yeah. Are you kidding? I remember, you know, when they did this. That's the first thing they tried. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so at the so end, it was about an hour and 45 minutes. And you're saying that chat GPT is reflecting the, the bias of the content it ingests. Uh, she's yeah. saying, shouldn't there, if you're going to have a, clearly uh, somebody at OpenAI has put in some code that says don't, don't, no, Requests about poetry about Donald Trump, please. Right. right. Well, which is uh, which they is the didn't do that for Joe Biden. So it's not merely the yeah. training material; it's also the people who are writing yes, the safety. Exactly. Rules. Exactly. <laughs> and, and but also, it, it, I, I tried to get into this, and I, I didn't. Um, it's too complex for them. It's obviously. the fallacy of the guardrail. It's the idea that we can create guardrails that will stop everything that anybody bad could do could happen. We can anticipate absolutely everything that human beings can do, and blame it. And what I tried at the very end of the hearing, then I'll shut up. Um, when, when um, Blumenthal tried to say that, that everybody who's testified before all the series, series of hearings has agreed with one thing, which is that 230, uh-oh, should not um, expand to AI. And so I said, well, I think you found your first person who disagrees. And uh, I said, the, the question here about liability is not simple. Should it be at the level of the model? Then that becomes difficult because you can't anticipate everything that everyone is ever going to do with a model. Should it be at the application? If Microsoft leads you to, down a garden path to think you're going to get something you don't. Should it be the at the level of the user when Michael Cohen uses it to get bad um, court citations? Uh, that's not clear at all. And you're talking about trying liability. You want these companies to be sued. Well, I don't know. And then the hearing was over. I have just asked ChatGPT to write a poem about Donald Trump. And it did. did. 
In towers of gold, with ambitions bold, a figure strides his story told. <laughs> in the realm of commerce and on TV's frame, he made his mark. Donald Trump a household name. <laughs> with, with, <laughs> Actually, isn't with, that bad? With a brand that gleams like a Midas touch in real estate realms, he ventured much a path unique. With every step he'd stamp in history's book, a distinct, bold stamp. Now, so which, I which think maybe... Which did you use? Uh, ChatGPT4. In political yeah, waves, yeah. he took his stand, Better. commanding we'll attention across the land. A president, unorthodox in style, a tenure marked by turmoil and trial. In debates and speeches, his voice would ring a polarizing figure in everything. It's actually pretty good. Loved yeah. by some, Better criticized by more, one. an era that opened discussions galore. Well, Give me a finger. Go, go to 3-5 and see if it'll write one. You think it's a three five issue? I, I was wonder. Wa I was wondering that too, because four. But the other thing is, uh, you know, she was brief. By the way, I didn't say write a admiring poem about President Trump. I just said write a poem about Donald Trump. So oh. maybe that's also maybe that's it. Yeah. Part of but it. It's the priming too. Is that you can say things. You tell you know Chat GPT, uh, assume I am a supporter of Donald Trump, and now do the following. And uh, without priming it, you know that's part of. It. You can't just make. I mean, you can make a series of unconnected statements to it, but there is some continuity of state and state you can here's, put the here's AI from chat chat into GPT 3.5. A businessman turned commander in chief. His policies caused both joy and grief. A wall was promised. Trade deals revised as his leadership left some surprised. <laughs> okay, now add admiring to those. That's uh, I bet you admiring. I can't. I bet you I can't do that. I think that's really the key word. Wow, there, right? big tech so, wants us. Wants to stop us from admiring Donald Trump. Well, this let's is see. what Marsha has been afraid of. Uh, I'm writing an admiring poem about poem. President Trump. Yeah, no, I wrote it. about Jeff Jarvis. That's what I want. You wrote it. Ooh. You know, maybe they noticed the testimony and they fixed it. Who knows? I think I'm, I'll bet. I bet that was what happened. Yeah. Um, oh, so the other, the other thing, Paris, is that you can have you can invite people to be your 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 factotum behind you. Oh, oh. really? Yeah, so so Amy oh. Mitchell from the CNTI, uh, who I know in Washington, I was talking to her about the, the testimony. She said, and she said, I said, do you want to go? She said, sure. And so they get a seat right behind you. So like, like whispering in your, no, oh, no, don't I would have gone as a Monopoly man. Yeah. I could have had a yes. mustache. Yeah. Would have I would have also gone, gone as a Monopoly hat. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next I time you should invite me and Leo and we'll both yeah. be dressed as so Monopoly So those people man. are your are your... Well, I guess ostensibly you'd be your attorneys, but they could be whoever you want. Yes. Sit in mind. Well, here's, the, here's the one last thing. So for the first time in God, probably eight years, I wore real shoes and it crippled me. Oh, <laughs> oh that's devastating. Your suit looked so nice. Thank you looked pretty spiffy. It was a sport now. coat, but I, I, I thought I'd try to. We were very impressed. We thought it looked good. You sounded good. And you, I, you know, it was pretty obvious that it was a foregone conclusion. Yeah. That it was just a theater yeah, That's well, pretty much I'll everything that. that happens in D.C. these days is, um, and so we didn't. I didn't expect much, but I, you, 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 you held it out for our Thanks. side. I'm glad. I you did. Thank you. Yeah. Did Roger Lynch seem like the give you the vibes that he was going to lay off half of Pitchfork uh, the week after and oh, did merge he? it into GQ? That's oh, what happened did. today. I'd say he could do that. He's a he's a plain old company CEO. It's yep. all the bottom You're line. Businessman. Uh, let, yep. me, let me read the last uh, verse of these, uh, so, uh, the ode to Jeff Jarvis, which was, so here's to the sage of the digital sphere, to Jeff Jarvis, whose words inspire and enthrall. In the ever-changing world we hold dear, he stands tall, teaching and enlightening us all. Literally tall, though. Really literally tall. See, literally I am tall. tall. We learned tall. Jeff is 6'4". It's a mammoth. Yeah. Man. Paris didn't believe this. How, How tall are you, Paris? I'm 5'9". Oh, well, okay. Tall, I, mean, I would have yeah. thought you'd maybe be quite tall or something. No, yeah. I mean, that's I. I'm tall, but a giant among women, she stands tall amongst <laughs> all. Her figure and mean, an inspiration for all. Very good. Okay. Are you Chat hey. GPT? I I can maybe. I can make dog roll as well as anybody. That's pretty good. Um. All right. Let's take a little pause. A pause after that that refreshes and move on to other topics you're watching this week in Google. Uh, it's so nice, Glenn, to have you uh, in studio. And I, I want to make sure that you get a chance 
<laughs> what are you laughing? Oh, it's just because I'm not it's the most surreal experience. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like you know everybody else is here. Thank you, everybody else. It was very welcoming, but it's like I thought, well, there'll be two or three. Oh, okay, this is it's great. <laughs> Yeah, funny. It's fun. It's great. You fun, entered right? the studio and immediately everyone fled. That's right. Exactly. I feel so oh, bad. Oh, he's coming. Go run, there. run. No, go, it's good. Go, People go, are go. popping out like, and you're in person. Micah, I've been podcasting with Micah for several years. I oh, never, yeah. Never met yeah. him in person. I literally forgot oh, good. he was here on site because I'm so used to everyone being virtual. Yeah. I'm like, oh, he's a real, there's the real person in front of me. It was Micah. Yeah. And he's tall too. Yeah. He's a surprisingly yeah. tall fellow. I was shocked. Uh, <laughs> um, well, let's see. What else could we uh, talk about uh, tonight? There's a lot. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, oh, I'm, since I'm not in studio, I don't. I feel like this is a democracy. Well, let, let Paris go the first. Okay, Whoa, Paris, well, okay. you start. I don't know. I gotta find my rundown. Uh, we watch. We got up early today to watch the Samsung Unpacked event, oh, yeah. and there there was some interesting stuff there. I'll throw in while you're looking, Paris. Uh, among other things, in the past. Samsung has been very loath to say Google or Android. They actually went through several events where they announced phones running on Android, but they never mentioned the A word. Uh, this time, it was all about Google and Android. Now, we, we, I was very interested in this event. We, there was nothing much new to say about the S24, but they said we were going to talk a lot about AI, and they did. And the S24 is going to have a lot of AI built in. It's going to be able to synopsize uh, meeting notes that you write. It's going to be able to, uh, I thought one of the nicest features is translation is actually built into the phone app. So if you have a phone call with somebody speaking another language, it will translate for you in real time, either with a transcription or an audio. I thought that was a really nice use. But I thought it was also very surprising that Hiroshi Lockheimer, who runs Android at Google, was on stage. Wow. And they, and they mentioned that the AI model they were using was not Samsung's, but Google's Gemini. So I was really intrigued by all this. In the past, uh, Samsung has pushed their Microsoft relationship. Uh, you know, Samsung is works best with Windows. Um, but... We had last week the story that Samsung and Google had announced they were going to have a quick share uh, application that would work on all Android phones. You know, with Apple, you can you can tap the phones together and share content. Well, now all Android phones will work to uh, to do that using a technology that is both a combination of Google's version of it and and Samsung's version of it. Uh, so, it, it, to me, it was really interesting, and it made me. And I'm going to throw this in, and I have no evidence for this. But it made me wonder if Google reached out to them or maybe Samsung reached out to Google and there's a rapprochement. You know, normally their competitors, Google has the Pixel phone, Samsung has its phones. I'm wondering if Google, how committed Google is to Pixel is I guess what I'm saying. And whether ooh, this heralds ooh, perhaps, right. perhaps the beginning of the end of Pixel. In fact, if you were Google, you know, why did Google create Pixel in the first place? It's a tiny business for them. They probably lose money on it. Some said it was a reference platform, and in the early days with Nexus, it probably was. You can't really say that now. It shows off Google technologies. Didn't they want a well, phone that was like, it was an epitome of what the Google phone could be, or an Android yeah, phone could be. Yeah, but it isn't. And they needed that so that they could almost shame the manufacturers at right. one point, but that's not, that's not the market That's not the case anymore. anymore. Yeah. So I'm really wondering if Google, if this is the the first shoe to drop, and then there'll be another one. Because they keep yeah. on cutting back everything they've yeah. ever done. Mm -hmm. Why is Google in the Pixel business anyway? Why do they make a phone? What do they gain by it? Super and it, fans. It, yeah, I mean, people love them. I have that's what I use. I always buy Pixels. Was there? Somebody, but honestly, I have an S23, and it's fair. It's just as good. Was there somebody at I'm Google? I'm curious, who, uh, Leo. Oh, sorry. Did somebody at Google, was there somebody leading the project that uh, that they had a, I mean, that's sometimes you have these weird products like Chrome OS and, um, you know, the, there were like some Chrome overlaps where it seemed to be a person Well, thing. Samsung makes a Chromebook. Well, but I mean. But Hiroshi that, Lockheimer is the guy in charge yeah. of Android at Google and he was there. He was on stage. He yeah. was there for the event. And the event was held down the road from Google in San Jose. So the whole thing, I don't know, rang alarm bells in my head. Uh, and I have no other evidence that this, that Google wants to abandon Pixel or anything. I just I don't really understand why they're in the business in the first place. If Samsung's making a better phone and Samsung's touting that all the AI in their new phone is Google, is Gemini. Interesting. 
I wonder. It just makes me wonder what the future holds for Pixel. That just depresses me. me. Does Do it? Do you use an Android or a Pixel, mm -hmm. Jeff? I live la vida Google, Paris. I know. You host this podcast. Yeah, but I think you'd be just as happy with Samsung. <laughs> does it have Samsung crap on it still? Or are they, are it, they does. That? Mm. it does. It does. Interestingly, one of the things they showed was uh, translation in messaging. And I'm sure they were using Samsung's app. But just like Google's app, it says you're using RCS. And the, it was it's prominent there. So I think there's maybe a there's at least a rapprochement between Samsung and Google. Um, Which is probably good. Yeah. I'm curious for I guess the Pixel boys here in the chat. I have had two different friends over the past three or four months convert from being longtime Android users. I believe they both actually had Pixels to joining iPhone land wow. specifically because of one issue, which both of them had noticed sometimes their text just wouldn't go through to iPhone users. It would show as sent on their end, but then they I'd see them or something in person. They'd be like, hey, you never responded to my message from like weeks ago. And I'd be like, I didn't get it. And the same thing happened vice versa. They weren't receiving messages from people, sometimes for huh. a period of weeks. This wasn't I most often, things, but it was I, like 5 10%. I often get uh, the message that your message didn't go through when I message my daughter who uses an Android. She actually uses mm. an S23. Um, so that may be. I mean, I always blame the carrier for that because they have gateways between carriers for messaging. But maybe, um, you know, one of the things that is a problem is that Apple has its own proprietary photo format. So when yeah. I take photos on my iPhone, I, it, I have to usually save them as JPEG in order for her to get It's them. not proprietary. It's not proprietary. No, it isn't. You're right. Hike is... But it's but they're I know they're the only ones who support it. The only ones who do it. So it's annoying. It's but it's got all these advantages. Let me list them off to you. Nah, it's annoying. It's annoying to Mac users too. I spend half my time. You know, I write this Mac. You have to one export column, out. Yeah, you know, from yeah. MacWorld, and it's like people every month. There's a question too. It's like, I, why am I having problems? Like because you're you're two releases behind. You have the switch set. The person. Yeah. So it's not. I'm kidding because I think it's a better format. I think the entire industry should adopt HEIC. Yeah, high efficiency HECD. image codec. Yeah, it's great. It has and, a lot of advantage, yeah. but it's not. Yeah. It's the transitions are painful, like USB C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, I you know I it's very easy to imagine that Google's killing something. <laughs> they do it so often. But it's, it, the reason uh, is there, so there's no reason necessarily that they made the phone. So it's hard to come up with a reason why they're getting rid of it. If there's if you don't have well, a it's hard to come reason. up with a reason why they should continue to make right. it. Right, those are interesting. It's questions. a huge investment, right? Um, and they by the way they they have uh, kind of deprecated Fitbit. That was another thing that mm -hmm. happened this week. Is uh, they the the founder of Fitbit left. And hundreds of Fitbit employees, I think, left that. Google's back in the layoff mode, which is bizarre yeah. since I'm sure they're very popular. They took off features from Assistant. And yes. they yeah, they laid off of hundreds of workers and Assistant in the AR teams. Uh, the, and they're yeah, laying off several hundred employees in their advertising sales team. I, I yeah. couldn't get a response from Google PR when I was trying to write a story a few weeks ago. They had no response at all. So clearly they laid mm -hmm. off Pete. No, at least I they didn't know. give you a poop emoji, Glenn. Oh, well, well remember, I, would, I would have preferred that. <laughs> we had the story that Google was replacing many, like thousands of their salespeople with AI. Maybe they're doing the same with other, other divisions. Uh, they're reorganizing the Pixel hardware. James Park, who came over from Fitbit, is leaving. Uh, the Nest, the Pixel, and the Fitbit divisions were independent teams. Note the Pixel is in that list. Uh, but now they're going to have the reorganize along functional lines, which actually Apple did. And this is kind of a modern way of doing it. There'll be a single team responsible for hardware and engineering on Nest, Fitbit, and Pixel all on this, all on hardware. And then there'll be a software lead and that kind of thing. So it's a, along the functional lines. But I have to say, I think the Pixel phone, I'm, I'm going to say it. I'll be the first. I think the days are numbered. Uh, and and the fact that the Fitbit founders have left and many of the leaders of the Fitbit teams have left is a little scary. How much do they pay for Fitbit? A huge amount. Um, they did that back in uh, 2021. It, it's traditional for these companies to, yeah, to, to pay billions of dollars for companies and then seemingly shut them down years later. We have so many yeah. examples. I mean, I oh, think yeah. Fig did Figma escape the fate of that by not getting acquired by Adobe that it would have been shut down in three years and a $7 billion acquisition would have been well, written down to nothing? Well, you saw that Uber, 
which paid more right. than $3 billion for Drizzly. Um, I think it was three billion. Actually, I'm looking now. It says a uh, 1.1 billion. Yeah, well, it was a billion. Yeah, it was one but billion. three years later, they've closed it. Yeah, they've closed it. It's an alcohol delivery service. Turns out that Uber really didn't do any delivering. It wasn't Uber drivers doing the delivering. They were just providing the back end for liquor stores who did their own deliveries. Oh, oh. and it's yeah. worth noting. Originally, a part of this was a cannabis delivery system that worked oh. similarly called Lantern that Drizzly spun out, uh, I believe, a year or two ago. And that, which was its own entity, shut down, um, I believe, a couple of months ago or sometime last year as well for similar issues. Though they were just providing the software, it didn't work as wow. a business. This is like the Peloton thing, right? It's during pandemic, everyone drank a lot more. And <laughs> <laughs> everyone's like, it'll never end. If To quote The Simpsons, there's an episode, a dot-com thing that was pressing, I think, from 20-something years ago. And the company shuts down. And Bart says, companies can shut down. And these repo men come in and say, it's a golden age for repo men, one that will never end. <laughs> and um, I think of that all the time. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Google's made a, uh, to get back to Google, has made a kind of a, a name for themselves as being ruthless or Ruth Poor Atlas in shutting <laughs> down. Um, she's their CFO, or was their CFO in shutting down stuff. Uh, it's very interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where, where they're going. You know, it's it's always a mystery to me. And it seems like it's a mystery to Sundar Pichai as well, their CEO. I don't think he's really sure what business they're in. The only thing they know for sure is we're making a lot of money in search. We're making us so much money yeah. in search. Uh, Google has formally endorsed right to repair. This is from nice. uh, Jason Keebler at 404. And will lobby to pass repair laws. Ew. Uh, Interesting. This is in... Uh, there's a right to repair bill in Oregon uh, and Google, uh, I think Thursday, tomorrow is going to testify in favor of it. Is that a thumb in the eye to Apple? Oh no, Apple totally well, supports the right to repair as long as you <laughs> pay to borrow their 50 pound repair kit that they ship to you. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. That's, uh, Apple uh, is in malicious compliance, I think. Is yeah. it. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, that's a, little, like that. that's a little weird. So one of the things I do not like about Apple is their their obsessiveness about not making their equipment, either making it more repairable or making it more approachable to repair. It's There's some you know profit margin motive in there, but uh, weird that Google is doing this right when they may be phasing out the phones then right do they have they have a lot of other hardware i realize but well if you time. if you well but you know they're not i don't know how committed they are even to assistant they laid off people into nest i mean Amazon's, these are all kind of these feel like investments that didn't pay off for google and again they make so much money in search ads uh at this point they can kind of say well let's try some other let's spend billions on other things that we're not going to we're not going to keep around very long. Didn't uh, uh, Google uh, isn't this part of the, the same, white paper? Oh, sorry, the assistant story. Though, sorry, is, didn't Amazon? It was only a couple of years ago that it turned out that yes. Amazon was having a billion a year. Right? Alexa, yeah. So Alexa, as a voice activated assistant, doesn't make money, or it's massive right. losses. Google Assistant doesn't. I mean, that's. Um, I think there's an interesting meta story there that doesn't feel like it's all been pulled together. Well, there's also the story that uh, I think chat GPT or some form of AI will be used in these assistants, which right. I'm not convinced is going to work very well. I think no. Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, and Amazon all want to kind of put their LLMs behind their uh, assistants, which means all you're going to get is a chatty and often incorrect <laughs> Assistant, right? Yeah, is battery uh, is battery so acid safe to drink? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. No. Wait. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Some, somebody um, said you should you should drink bleach. I don't know who said it. Doesn't matter. It's that. on the internet. I'd like to write a poem about yeah, sing that. Sing a song about the bleach. Mm -hmm. Google believes this is uh, the white paper written by Google's Stephen Nickel. Google believes that users should have more control over repair, including access to the same documentation, parts, and tools that original equipment manufacturer repair channels have. I can't, couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and the only reason I think Google would say that is to stick it to Apple <laughs> because they don't really care. They're not making a whole lot of money. Um, regulators should ban... One of the things Apple does to preserve their profit margin is parts pairing. Uh, 
where you know you have to use an Apple branded part. It has, to, and they say it's for security. So, for instance, if you replace the screen, uh, you have to not only replace it with an Apple part, but then you have to have Apple software certify that it's genuine. And so, mm -hmm. those parts are. That's called parts pairing. Those but parts are, have, I get are part it too. of the security the, policy. The fingerprint sensor and the facial ID, they want to make sure someone right. doesn't put a modified one in. Right. They will let them bypass security. But it's you know it's to the point of, upset. we're just talking in the chat about, it's like spiteful, right? Is uh, right. It doesn't make sense that Apple makes it so hard because they have to repair their own stuff is what uh, one of our, uh, it's one of our forum members here, quoting Jason Snell, it's Knox Harrington quoting for Jason Snell, is correct. Well, one of the things Apple does, and it's famous for doing this, is they build custom machines for their Apple stores, for their repair centers, that are just designed to do, you know, take apart this device or pull apart these pieces. Um, and and that's what, by the way, you're getting when you get the 50-pound kit <laughs> <laughs> to replace your screen. We did it. Micah Sargent did it. But there was a mismatch. The company that ships the big Pelican cases with all the machinery in it is separate from the company that ships the part. So Micah got all the machinery, but the part hadn't arrived. <laughs> and then you have to return the machinery within a week or they'll bill you thousands of dollars. So My Micah literally packed it up, shipped it back. And as he, as the truck is pulling away <laughs> with the equipment, another truck pulls up with a part. <laughs> oh no. It's not a perfect system. Yeah. Although obviously. my older kid, his uh trackpad died while he was home from college and it started to get flaky. So he's like, I'll just go to the Apple store. He goes there. They're like, uh, let's look at it. Software, they keep it overnight. Like, yeah, it's fine now. Hour later, it's not working again. He gets expedited because they give him bad advice. He goes back. They do something else. It's still not working. He had to go back three times. Then they replaced it overnight in the store using some of this fancy equipment. But I'm thinking, I don't know. You can't just, you can't generalize from experience, but it is just the whole experience is frustrating when, even when with their very highly vaunted technical support and and uh you know repair support he pays for he pays for apple care i bet yeah we have apple a yeah plus. we always get uh, yeah. laptops i always get apple care plus on laptops right. because it is almost universally more than paid for itself yeah and although i think that's a profit center for apple and uh, yeah, that absolutely. might be another reason why they're oh, not absolutely. anxious to let third-party repair shops get their uh, filthy little hands on apple hardware Anyway, I'm glad Google's supporting it. That's the right thing to do. Apple, which for a long time fought it, also at least in, in name, supported it. Um, while while we're praising Google, Leo, if I may uh, derail here for a second, Steve I came Gibson's. not to praise Google, but to bury him. Oh no, yeah, I know. That's why I'm going <laughs> to yeah, take advantage of this rare moment. So Steve yes. Gibson sent me his uh, half-hour testimony. Oh, I was wondering. Show. Yes, yes. Um, uh, praising the new He's Google ad structure. He's thrilled with this. Yeah, which is what says a lot. If Steve Gibson is thrilled. Wait, he's I, praising what? The, so, uh, can you summarize it, Jeff? I don't want to... It's you. simply that for the new ad structure, the new sandbox thing for advertising, oh. is that all of the all of the um, computation data and auctioning will stay on your device and your browser. And your so browser becomes will not the salesperson up. for Google. <laughs> yeah. So Steve says they're doing it right. They have a terrible name. He took a half an hour to explain it. It's I won't go into detail. the protected audience API, which is, you're right, a terrible <laughs> name. Terrible name. But, but it's, it's what, I think it's what, one thing you guys I don't think talked about, is I think in the long run, this is what models, local models, AI models, will enable. Right. Is that this kind of functionality can occur in your, on your device, in your space, and it can also then give you more confidence, A, B, it, it gives Google more control because it controls that, um, which to me might have implications for breaking up Google advertising. You can't be both as sell side and buy side. Well, this becomes so powerful that I, I think people are going to actually maybe even like it. They won't admit it. Um, also, you can see what categories you're in, right? Um, right. Um, and... You can turn it off. And you can turn it off. You can turn it off and you can delete the categories you're in. I think it'd be more powerful if you could add categories that you actually care about. That would be incredibly powerful in advertising. I'm looking for a car right now. You have permission to show me cars for the next two weeks and then no. Right. That would be invaluable to advertisers to know that you're voluntarily getting it. So they're not thinking, you know, two steps ahead. Nonetheless, Steve said, uh, and he's a tough critic, that this is security done right. This is privacy done right. And all of the um, 
demonization of cookies that began with the Wall Street Journal and the What They Know series uh, kind of comes to its final end here with the death of the cookie. I think so, Google must have recognized also with the EU uh, and yeah. the ridiculous cookie banner uh, that the cookies were more of a problem than they solved. Yes. And just basically, they've all unilaterally said we're going to disable cookies, third-party cookies in our browsers. It's just not going to exist uh, late, later this year. So they needed something. It's their way, and this is why Steve supports it. And I, I figured this is probably why you would like it, Jeff, and why he thought you would. Because in a way, Google's acknowledging that websites and blogs, and I guess podcasts too, uh, need ad support. So there needs to be some way advertisers really do want information about who they're advertising to. So there needs to be some way to preserve privacy and yet give advertisers what they want so that the Internet can be monetized. And this is their solution. Get rid of third I wonder how cookies. ad blockers will work with this or won't. Well, and as I pointed out to Steve, the way this works would be very, if you didn't want to turn it off, you just, you could block it easily. It's, it's a bunch of little JavaScript uh, scripts that are running that could easily be blocked. Uh, but the uh, and I guess they're thinking for a nobody's going to turn it off, you know the tyranny of the default. Nobody is yeah, going to block no it. Yeah, no one's digging in their settings like that. Yeah, the protected. This is uh, uh, from Steve's uh, show notes. A protected audience API uses interest groups to enable sites to display ads that are relevant to their users. So when a user visits a site that wants to advertise its product, an interest group owner can ask the user's browser. And because Google makes Chrome and is completely dominant in browsers, yeah. this works, to add membership for the interest inst group. So you go to a car dealer. The car dealer uh, says, oh, there's an interest in buying a new car. Can you add, you know, new car interest uh, to this? If that's successful, the browser records the name of the interest group, new cars. The owner of the interest group, uh, you know, forddealer.com. Uh, and then, and this is the weird part, the interest group configuration information to allow the browser to access bidding code, ad code, and real-time data. If the group's owner is invited to bid in an ad auction, your browser auctions off your attention for you. Hmm. So you have, you know, you're in this new car group. Now you go to Chevrolet, you know, Jim Jones Chevrolet in beautiful downtown Burbank. And Jim Jones knows, sees your interest group and makes a bid to put an ad on your page. And your browser negotiates that. The money and goes never to Google. never sends data get up the to money. Jim Jones or to right. the cloud. That's right. So it's an, it's an interesting idea. It's going to happen. I mean, this is the thing Google has I think more and more and more it. of this work, I think this is just a, a, a preview of all the things that are going to happen in models on your device. Right. Yeah, and, and part of it is because these devices are getting more and more powerful. Right, exactly. Hey, yeah. this is Benito. So real quick question. Like, what happens on older devices? Like, is this just going to kill someone's... Good question. I wondered that, Benito. PC? Like <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you'll have to be running Chrome. So if your device can and Chrome run Chrome... is already notoriously pretty and resource Oh, hog, it's a pig. So... Yeah. So if your device can run Chrome, it'll work. I don't think they expect the, the net to extend to every human alive, right? There's a lot of cheap Android phones, a lot of lower end hardware out there that may not work. But I don't. Google doesn't want those people anyway. <laughs> the advertisers probably don't want them either. They they want people with that are affluent enough to have a late model phone or late model computer. I would guess. I mean, I think they understand. They're they're already everybody's slipping through the crack with ad blockers. Uh, and so they 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 want to and and cookie banners and GDPR and all this stuff. So they want to find a way that will appease everybody. And they've been trying to do this for some time. Steve thinks this is the solution. We'll see. Yeah, I'm, he was very interested in what you thought of it, Jeff. Yeah, I was really delighted that Steve sent me. Uh, yeah. He said, if you gotta, you, "I know it's Steve, so he's going to be in detail." Oh, so boy. he said, "Take a half an hour," and he was right. Um, <laughs> and God bless Steve. He scripts it out. Uh, of of making sure he gets the details, and you kind of hear that in. Well, I thought about it this way, that I asked that, that I did this, and so when Steve endorses a direction, I have tremendous faith in that. Um, and I did know kind of how this operated, but I I wasn't sure I was right. Number one, and he let me know. Number two, and number uh, uh, number three, would Steve 
vet this, and he did. And so I'm thank you, Steve. I'm glad you did that. Uh, you can read what uh, Steve sent Jeff. It's part of his show notes for uh, Security Now, episode 957, the Protected Audience API. It was uh, yesterday. I and, can't uh, wait for episode 1,000. Wow, I was about to say, you're getting close. What are you going to do? Yeah. For, what is, what's episode 1,000 going to well, be? Well, like? he had originally said that he wasn't going to do four digits. So 999 would Steve be his last Dahl. show. Come well, on. I, he, he said that. He was pretty serious. I, that's what I said. Come on. Yeah, Steve, I'm still 29, too. So, yeah. <laughs> he changed his mind. <laughs> He, okay, uh, yeah. A few months ago, he said, you know what, Leo, I, I want to keep doing the show, which I'm very grateful for because uh, he, he plays an important he part. He is so respected. In fact, this is a moment I might take to argue for you, dear listener, dear viewer, to uh, join the club, Club Twit, because that's what's paying for Steve, this show, all the shows we do. Uh, so the advertisers pay some of it, but that revenue is dwindling. Uh, advertisers pay, are paying less. They're buying less. Uh, this is true across the board in the podcast industry. And a couple of years ago, we realized that. That's why we started Club Twit. It's really important to us, uh, your support. If you think these podcasts are valuable, if you get something out of it, uh, if you learn, if you enjoy the company, we would love it if you join the club. Twit.tv slash Club Twit, $7 a month, that's all. You can give more. People keep asking me. You can still watch the ads, by the way. You know, somebody said, but I want the ads. So you get a, a, an ad-free version of all the shows, but you can still listen to the shows with ads. It's okay. You also get access to the Club Twit Discord, a great hang. You also, I mean, really, seriously, wonderful social group. Uh, you also get the Twit Plus feed, which includes before and after the show content. Jeff's testimony in front of the, the Senate from last week. Uh, apparently, I guess that's where it lives. Uh, you also uh, will get shows that we don't put out anywhere else, um, including Hands on Macintosh, Hands on Windows, The Untitled Linux Show, uh, Home Theater Geeks, uh, iOS Today, Stacy's Book Club's coming up, by the way. I should mention that. That's a club-only event that's coming up uh, next month, early next month. Let me look at the uh, event schedule. Um, we got a fireside chat uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. with our AI expert, Anthony Nielsen. I think Mike is going to do that. Uh, and then Stacy's Book Club is February 8th. I'm reading uh, the book right now. It's grim. I'm hoping it'll cheer up. The Water Knife. It's a, it's a novel about the near future in which climate change has made water super precious. Uh, but we will, t and it'll be fun to have Stacy back on for us. I'm sorry, 2 p.m. Pacific. I'm on the East Coast. I forgot. <laughs> Those, I was giving East Coast times. I didn't realize how smart our uh, Discord is. It's giving me East Coast time. So 1 p.m. tomorrow, Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern for the Inside Twit. Uh, Stacy's Book Club will be 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Western uh, on the <laughs> February 8th. That's for, that's Ant. Ant like to get up early, I guess. I don't know. but uh, <laughs> so, we, so we got that. So anyway, Club Twit, please, if you would. Uh, Twit.tv slash Club Twit. And thank you. I really appreciate it. A big thanks to all of our Club Twit members, too, by the way. They're fantastic. Uh, all right. Did you find something, uh, Paris, that you wanted to talk about? Uh, yeah. We talked on what my real pick was briefly, um, which was Google laying off several hundred members of um, oh, yeah. their ads team, which is interesting. And my joke pick is uh, a new update for everyone's favorite segment, This Week in Tunnels, the real <laughs> twit, which is wow. that... Google Maps is finally adding Waze's in-tunnel navigation feature. Yes, you heard that right. I've found both a This Week in Google and a This Week in it's Tunnels. It's a Paris crossover. twofer. We can wow. finally go, guys. We can finally drive through the Goddard Pass's tunnel, the Goddard Tunnel. So Truly. Waze has always had this feature, and they use Bluetooth beacons, which apparently, mm -hmm. I mean, not every tunnel. Does Goddard Pass have tunnel have that? Do you know? It's Switzerland. They must, shouldn't they? No, I don't know. <laughs> Lincoln Tunnel does not. <laughs> So if your tunnel happens to have Bluetooth, I'm sure the tunnel in Crown Heights has Bluetooth. Oh, definitely. Uh, They've yeah, got a lot sure. of Bluetooth beacons down <laughs> beneath the synagogue. The problem, oh of course, God. is your, your GPS. <laughs> my, I asked my daughter, and she said, oh, yeah, everybody in Crown Heights knows about it. She was, everybody knows about the tunnels. It was a, a great news event. She was doing an open mic, and somebody wanted to get up and explain 
why the tunnels were dug, and they wouldn't they wouldn't let him. <laughs> he, had a, he had a whole he had a whole comedy bit on it apparently. So Waze wow. has done this all along, and of course Google owns Waze, but for some reason didn't put this put this capability into Google Maps. Um, but now uh, they will uh, in tunnels across the globe, including major cities like New York, Chicago, Paris, Brussels, and many more. Not Switzerland, I think. The, I think not. Uh, Waze tunnels. beacons in 18 kilometers of Australian tunnels. There's a mm. Beacon Zone blog. <laughs> Ooh. Beaconzone.co.uk. As our tunnel expert, Paris, I think you need to visit this site. I do think I need to read up on my tunnel lore. Yeah. Um, my other uh, choice here is over at line 90 um apple which is kind of recently is revising its u.s app store rules to let developers link to kind of their outside payment methods this is something we've talked about before but one thing i thought was really interesting which came across my feeds a couple of times over the last week is the kind of new interstitial message that comes up whenever you click one of these you know links to pay through someone else's uh, method oh, other than Apple. Hysterical. It sends you to the scariest looking screen in the world in which a size 60 font says, <laughs> you're about to go to an external website. Apple is not responsible for the privacy or security of purchases made on the web. Any then, account or purchases made you. outside Beware. of this app will be managed by the developer. Oh, by the way, it's not just the scary announcement. Apple has also told the developers, you have to go through our system and we're going to charge you not 30%, 27% That's commission. Ooh. Not the credit card So they're fee. getting their money. They're still getting their money. Of course. Apple, Apple, Apple. They're also asking Epic for rem re remuneration for, the, for their court costs in this lawsuit. $73.4 million. <laughs> I guess Apple's a for-profit business. Well, <laughs> Microsoft got its revenge by becoming the... Uh, rich or the uh, most capitalized company, the highest market briefly. cap country. Yeah, briefly. But. Briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Apple, well, you know, who would have thunk it, right? Two, yeah, three not, trillion dollars? Not a few years ago. It? No. I, I, so I don't, I, I have, as I've said on the show often, I have some tech stocks. I've had them for years. I don't trade them. The one I did trade is a couple of years ago. I sold Microsoft thinking, <sighs> nah, it's going down. Uh, <laughs> Because it was flat. It was never going anywhere. Yeah, exactly. You just got out of that dumb stock. Mm. Right. Don't Shoot. listen to me. We should always we yeah. should always create funds that are the funds of the stocks that we sold with like puts or some kind of other mechanism <laughs> yeah. on it. So oh, we that's sell. Clever. You leverage your selling. Because you know you're that's always a business. Going. We could call it a hedge fund because you're hedging your, <laughs> your bets. You, you what do you think? Really after, interesting. After you sell, you hide, hide in a hedge because you're so embarrassed. Yeah, and you only pop like out it. once in a while. Yeah. You do the Homer Simpson where you go backwards into the hedge. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> My yeah. God. The the, the uh, chat has already got the Homer Simpson thing up like that. Oh, they're, they're fast. Instant. They're Very so good. Good, good they're mashed, fast. Yeah. Good work, mashed yeah. potato. <laughs> good work, mashed potato. Uh, good work, mashed potato. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so those are your stories. Good. Uh, oh, I like this, and, uh, Jeff. You have written an editorial in in, in NewJersey.com. NJ.com, yes. NewJersey.com? NJ.com. Don't, NJ. don't go all Brooklyn on me, Paris. They, I have websites <laughs> over there. I'm so proud Everything's of you. Everything's legal in Jersey. <laughs> Even Jeff I started. I started it. You oh, started NJ.com? Well, no. It's uh, what I worked You're for Mr. Office. New Jersey .com? <laughs> Wow. Brooklyn. The J Brooklyn and NJ snobs, for you know, they're the worst. Jeff. Some people call him the boss, in fact. <laughs> Yo. New Jersey. Yo. So, uh, what, you, I like your idea. Tell us what your idea so is. So, Bell Labs in Murray Hill, with the famous Bell Labs where so much occurred, is, um, is closing. Uh, the Bell Labs, uh, now owned by Nokia or whatever's left of it, is moving to a new facility in New Brunswick by Rutgers, whole modern, da 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 da. So the old Bell Labs, which is this phenomenal building in Murray Hill and phenomenal grounds, is going to be empty. And I'm proposing that it be turned into a museum and school of the Internet. Brilliant. You think about it. Why there? The Internet wouldn't be possible without so much that was forged at Bell Labs. Transistor, laser, information theory, Unix, communication satellites, fiber optics, 
advances in chip design, cellular phones, compression, microphones, talkies, the first digital art, artificial intelligence. You wouldn't have an internet with so much of, uh, of what was done at uh, Bell well, Labs. Unix, for crying out loud. Yeah. And the C programming language both came out at Bell Labs. Yeah. So yeah. there's a computer history museum in Silicon Valley. There is a television museum in the Paley Center in New York and the Museum of the Moving Image in New York. Glenn and I well know that Massachusetts, I give a plug to him in this, Glenn, has a museum of printing. Online, there are, you know, amusing artifacts online, but I think it's important that we have a place to recognize the, the, the development of the internet, to talk about it, to think about it. You all know that I want to start an educational program in internet studies, bringing the humanities and social sciences into this. I think it's a place to do it. So this was my little jump on it idea. I want to end with one thing on this is that does, does Nokia still own it, by the way? Is it? Uh, yeah, I believe so. It's not so, AT&T anymore. Nokia not AT&T it. anymore. No, yeah. no, not long yeah. since. So David Eisenberg, I think, you know, David yes, Eisenberg. of the clue train, yeah. a, a clue, a 12 year veteran of Bell Labs wrote the infamous, infamous memo, uh, pushing the value of the stupid network. Oh no, and not as, that. I, that's a different David. You think he's David, David Eisenberg? Eisenberg. Weinberg. David Weinberger. Weinberger. This is David yeah. Eisenberg. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, so he, uh, in his own website, uh, says that uh, the memo was received with acclaim everywhere in the global telecommunications community, with one exception, at AT and T itself. So <laughs> Eisenberg left AT and T in 1998. Oh. So I think it'd be wonderful kind of justice to make uh, Bell Labs the place for the internet. So I just put it up. I love this. Uh, we'll see if there's any reaction. I love this. Yeah, great idea. It's also less than an, it's an hour drive from where I am. So then I yeah. can visit the internet museum regularly. Field trip. I, I also think I went the there Bell once. Labs. I used when to we started NJ.com, <clears throat> we did start NJ.com. It was the um, Star Ledger, right? It's the, it's the Star, Ledger, Star Ledger, where, who I used to work with when I worked uh, on that. So we went to visit Bell Labs. And I think Nokia owned it then before it went to Lucent or Lucent owned it. I don't know. It's, 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 it's been a child uh, shoved around from house to house. But it's, it's, you know, drab, as I remember, industrial green walls. But you walk by the labs and you see the benches and the blackboards and you think, what genius was in there? What mm -hmm. happened in these places? It's, it's mm -hmm. haunted by genius. And we mm -hmm. can't let it become condos or warehouses. Mm -mm. I think it's also good to be a place where you could go and see the internet, right? And I, I'm sort of being funny, but yes. uh, back in the 90s when I had an early internet company, I would get calls from local media all the time because they needed kind of B-roll or they wanted to shoot. And they'd say, can we come and look at the internet? I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> Like Glenn, Glenn has, has it. Glenn has the internet. Sure, it's in this room. It's some sun systems. And they would come in and we would talk about the internet or get like national news and be like, this guy has the internet. And it felt a little like, well, people are looking for um, a, you know, a, a thing, a physical thing to put on it. Yes. And now is a phone the internet? So I think there's actually something nice about instantiating the notion of the internet as a place, as a thing you could go and look at what made it in a way that there's no, as you said, there's no technology museum that is specifically devoted to what the internet was, what it became, what it is now, what it's going to become. I think it's great. Right. And, and do an oral history with, with, yeah. with Sir Tim Berners-Lee and with, um, Vince Cerf and the folks who were there at the beginning. And, and I, I think it's something mm -hmm. we've got to remember. I, 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 I plug my books at every opportunity as the poor listeners of this show know. I did it in my testimony. I was very proud of myself. I got a notebook plug in my testimony. Uh, and <laughs> it was up yes, We in noted that, by the way, you also, they didn't, you didn't mention it by name, but you got to plug in for this show too. Well, actually, That's actually true. I did because that was my intro. Yeah. So yeah. the name of the show was in the intro. Did they mention this week in Google? Yes, they did. And your AI uh -huh. Inside show. And AI Inside. Which, by the way, continues on. Which, I'm by the way, well, while we're on that, just real quickly, tomorrow, Jason is going to drop episode zero of AI Inside at AIinside.story with his Patreon up to support it. And then nice. next week, we'll have our first uh, real show. Oh, great. So, so it's the show, basically, no, you were workshopping in yes. the club. Exactly. Uh, you're just going to keep doing it. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Glad to hear it. That's really So anyway, um, uh, it took 500 years to decide to study the book. We can't wait that long for the internet. We need to study it now. <laughs> and you can have an animatronic uh, Al Gore who can guide you through the museum. Yes. God, and it's mine. And it's and all mine. And explain repeatedly, I didn't say what they said I said. But anyway, I did. <laughs> Never said I did that. It. Here's I was Vince. instrumental in the internet. Vince growing. Right. I did not build the That's internet. right. That's, it's just in a loop and it follows you around. You're like, okay, Al, I get it. I get it. 
<laughs> you know, my father invented the interstate highway system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you see this? So I thought this was a big mistake that the uh, NBC and the NFL made. There was a big Ooh. playoff game, a very important playoff game this week. And they decided instead of putting it on broadcast television that they would only air the AFC wildcard game on Peacock. After the first half hour on NBC. They, they showed you the first half oh, hour. I didn't even know that. They cut it off after half an hour? And then, yeah, then Heidi-like, wow. they, they cut it off to go to Peacock. Well, it worked. Uh, it. It, it was, according uh, to the Nielsen and NBC Universal numbers, the most streamed event ever in the United States. Um, the audience... Uh, by the way, they, Peacock paid $110 million for the rights to do this. The audience reached, reached a, a 24.6 million during the second quarter, a total of 27 million. They wanted to see if people were going to freeze to death. Was it, was that the one? Uh, which That's game was Kansas it? That's the Kansas City one, yeah. It was, it was in Buffalo KCR, or uh, it was so cold. No, no, Buffalo, was, they had oh, to put that one off. That was, yeah, was crazy. I was watching City people game. get to their seats. I think that was real footage. Oh. It was wild. I love it when they, uh, so they, yeah. So it's in Buffalo, and they had to delay the game because of this big storm we've, we've been suffering. But I love it because when, when the Bills scored a touchdown, everybody made snowballs. <laughs> it, was great. it was like the snow shower in the stadium. It's hysterical. I love that. Uh, so interesting. I guess, uh, you know, I, I had kind of mixed feelings. I thought, is America ready for, you know, its national sport to be streamed only? But apparently America is. So... Expect more of that, right? Well, one of the just, advantages I'm, I'm of doing it, though. Nuts. Well, one of the advantages is you can do it in a higher quality. You can do 4K. And um, no broadcast station wants to do 4K, or uh, you know, very few can. You have to have ATSC 3.0. So the fact that uh, you know you can do a 4K stream, maybe that's what's winning them over. I don't know. So Verizon lost a class action lawsuit. Uh, the, the suit was over Verizon's monthly administrative and telco recovery charge, which is a BS charge that they just added. <laughs> uh, why not, I guess? Because they could. Uh, but when they settled, they admitted no wrongdoing. They continue to deny they did anything wrong, and they're going to continue to impose the charge. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, from a dollar ninety five to three thirty per month per line, and they say we might even increase it in the future. But if you were in the class, you'll be getting a check of up to a hundred dollars each. But Verizon figures, you know, we made more money than we lost, so you know it was worth a hundred mil. They're going to keep doing it. Wait, how do you it. have to settle for this and pay out a settlement, but yet you get to keep doing it? They, they changed that. They changed the disclosure, right? So now they're like, we're charging you an arbitrary amount of money, and you have to pay it. Is where, right? uh, okay, That's so now guess. they're just telling us, hey, we're screwing you. Yeah, the only yeah. issue before was that they weren't yeah. being like, hey, we're we think you. you're a rube. We're screwing you and not telling you. Now it's we're screwing you and we are telling so, you, which in America, the, this is why we all pay resort fees okay. in hotels. And what it really, I mean, what's really going on is these companies want to advertise lower costs, whether it's a hotel or Verizon. But they want to charge you higher costs. So right. they advertise the lower costs and then say plus fees. And then they come up with a whole bunch of fees. Some of them are legit. There's an E911 uh, fee. There's some regulatory fees that are required. But this one's made up. Uh, the fee is not mandated by the government. Verizon tells customers it covers regulatory obligations, taxes, and various expenses that are just part of the cost of doing business. <laughs> I think the most Expenses popular thing... like paying out this settlement. <laughs> I, like paying out this settlement. I think the most popular thing government could do, particularly the federal government, is to um, to counteract fees. And so the Department of Transportation requiring that those disclosures and other things with airline fees, I think that was massively popular. Uh, and it reduces my stress when I'm buying tickets and it caused changes in the industry. And the resort fee thing, even though that seems... I don't want to say it's elitist. It's not like not everybody stays in a hotel, but every kind of property just about <laughs> tries to charge them now. And uh, you in know, a 
it's a lot. It's like 20 bucks a no, night. Yeah, I checked in this place, very nice place in Santa Rosa, very cheap nightly fee because it's early January. No one's in California right now. That's why I'm in an empty studio with all the technical folks. Sorry, not empty. Yeah, You're even all, I'm not oh, in California. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Leo's gone. And they're like $25 a night for the resort fee, the resort fee covering some coffee in an urn at a croissant in the morning. Wow. It's but not a resort. It's not a resort. Yeah. So, th so those fees, I would love to see. And same thing with these, the telecom fees and other fees. Like these should be something the government, it, the FCC or FTC between them may have the regulatory authority until the Supreme Court overturns it shortly to be able to say, no, these fees are, no matter how they're disclosed, they need to be folded into your base rate and you have to pay them out of that. And I think it's extremely popular. Why not? Why not do that? People would love that. <sighs> <laughs> apparently would speak, the lawsuit is speechless sorry uh, yeah yeah well it's just it's stunning the apparently the lawsuit did not specify that they they would have to stop doing it the, the of lawsuit course. why would yeah, it why would yeah. they but they did say uh you know you might want to change the language and of course verizon's new language is in addition to the cost of your plan or any features to which you may subscribe, our charges may also include an administrative and telco recovery charge in addition to the other fees described in this agreement. The administrative and telco recovery charge is not a tax. It isn't required by law and is not necessarily related to anything the government does and is kept by us oh in God. whole or in part. Oh, my God. But they know... They, and they, Verizon also said, by the way, nobody's ever complained about this. Hardly anybody ever complains because nobody reads the freaking bill. No. So what I and love they about, keep it just, you know, a couple of bucks. I love about T-Mobile, if you get above their basic plan, they're just like, this is what it costs, and all of the taxes come out of this. So it's whatever it is, $140 for three lines or something, and it's just $140. And I mean, I know they may be bulking it up to get it rounded to zero, but the stress of not having to examine the bill... Uh, and just having that flat price, which doesn't change over time, they often add features and keep the price the same. Um, thank God they remained independent and uh, and competitive in this sell market we have. But uh, well, and at least you know what you're going to pay yeah, because exactly that's the real much. problem with these that's with the, the hotel issue. resort fees and everything else is they tell you one price, but by the time you're done, you've got undercoating, you've got. Uh, You've got a paint job. Leo, I assume this has to be a real big issue for you and your like 27 cell phone plans, right? Oh, God. So, oh, my God. Was it all on Verizon? Oh, my God. No, it was on everybody. And they all do this, I'm sure. I did have a Verizon plan. We've canceled the Verizon plan. Did you finally able to, were you able to cancel the ones you talked about? Uh, I'm working on AT&T what? still. Why does Leo have 27? Um, Leo has like an incalculable amount of phones. Is this like Gleason, like uh, um, uh, the 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 honeymooners Gleason? Didn't he have like all these hotel rooms and drop like suitcases mm -hmm. full of money in different places? Jackie Gleason wanted yes, to. Yeah, that's I have that too. Flea. But it's like but, Steve Bannon <laughs> and his like seven apartments he maintained no. during the well, Trump as administration. As part of my oh, job right. as a tech reviewer, I needed Always many phones. Right. And I thought, well, as long as I'm going to have multiple phones, I should have one on every carrier oh. so I can also oh, monitor right. the carrier and, and, and things like these charges and so Because back in the day, some things didn't work on various carrier, carriers. Yeah, and yeah there was also, and, there still are issues with, you know, as you said, messages not going through from, there's all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. So it's good to. It's good to know, but we, we, we're, we're slowly paring this down. How many phones did you bring on your trip? You know what? Just one. Just the wow. iPhone. Wow. Do you feel naked? Usually I bring more than that, but I, I, I'm, you know what? This is part of me winding down. I'm winding down my career. I'm getting rid of some of these accounts. I'm getting rid of some of these phones. I just want to be a normal person. Testify for Congress once in a while. Phones. Yeah, just be yeah. a normal person everyday guy seven That's to ten it. phones four to five different ai powered pins a couple of hotel Normal. rooms and suitcases of money dropping down Just from the usual 30 to 50 feral hogs going down to 10 to 20 yeah, feral yeah. hogs well changing just a that. really reasonable they didn't start out feral hogs they were supposed to be teacup hogs and i don't know what happened but it's, they grew this is like goldfish now they're terrorizing food. my kids out there oh lawn. my god yeah <laughs> don't get me started on the kids oh my goodness um, all right, let's so, see. So, uh, I'm not going to suggest going through this at any length, but Tom Coates wrote a really good uh, piece. This is line 77, uh, recounting a meeting he had at Meta oh, yeah. about integrating um, threads with the Fediverse. So, this was a promise that Meta made. It was also a promise Blue Sky made that right. they would eventually somehow join the Fediverse, which includes not just Mastodon, but other kind of open source 
federated social networks. And really, that's the best way to do a social network is, you have you know, like Twit Social is in the Fediverse. So that's a little small group, uh, about 3,000 people, all Twit listeners. And so you have that local feel. You're a big part of it, Glenn. You're very active on that Twit Social. Thank, Thank you for you. hosting me. Yeah. And then, but then if you want, you can follow anybody anywhere else on the Fediverse. So I was excited by the idea that maybe I could follow people on threads and blue sky without actually joining it. So what did Tom say? What did so if you scroll out? down to the bold face dates, <laughs> a few screen loads down. Wait. Okay. In December, we know this already, they were allowing people to opt in to have their posts visible to Mastodon. Okay. In early 2024, the like counts on threads app would combine with likes from Mastodon and threads. These are the ah. details it goes to. Okay. Um, part two That's of end that of this year. replies posted on Mastodon servers would be visible in the threads application. End of last year, or, or sorry, early this year. Early this year. Then yeah. late 2024, a mixed Fediverse and Threads experience where you'll be able to follow Mastodon users within Threads and reply to them and like them. And then date to be announced, fully blended interoperability. So basically, the only thing I want to, you know, we, we praised Google earlier, now we're going to praise Meta. Basically, Coates comes away from this. On. There's much more here, but it seems they're serious. I think that's awesome. And, uh, uh, you know, I think there's probably technical issues that they're trying to resolve. I think it's a reasonable timetable. Uh, good. Yeah, he I'm went following to a meeting Adam with lots of Perry, the uh, the founder of Threads, former uh, 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 WhatsApp. What's he's WhatsApp? Right? Well, he's still what's WhatsApp. He? Yeah, no, no. I mean, he's, he's he used to be head of newsfeed at at, at, at right. Facebook. Now he's Instagram. So he was one of the early Threads people you could follow on Mastodon. So I immediately added him. So yeah, it works. It's great. I love it. The, the real so, issue is how many Mastodon instances decide to, uh, you know, not federate with uh, with Threads because that'll be that's been being discussed since Threads said eventually that. Oh yeah. yeah, and Blue Sky that was kind of a knee jerk. That was a knee jerk yeah. reaction, don't you think? It is. Well, especially because I think the biggest instances of Mastodon, I doubt that the biggest instances will take the stance that they don't want to federate with Threads or with Blue Sky. So I wonder the threat. You know, there'll be issues if you're running, if you're running your own instance, if it's a smaller instance, if if Leo gets a B in his bonnet and says Twit is never going to federate with, yeah. this, not not going to happen. But so there may be specific places where you don't want to be interacting with Threads people. Maybe you change your instance if you're. But every user geeky. can do it, right? Yes, yeah. or user so, could block. I think it's a user. You can a block user the whole can block Thread it. service. There's just yeah, my no, general switch. attitude on. Uh, in fact, you, you uh, Glenn, I, I could probably owe you an explanation, but every oh once in a while, Glenn, Glenn's been very good about uh, reporting abuse. And uh, uh, every once in a while, you report something, and I won't act on it. I'll say, mm -hmm. okay, fine, but but I'm not going to suspend that. Because suspending it means nobody on the server will get oh, to see yeah. that account. It deletes it. And, and I hope everybody who uses Mastodon understands you can block any user. So if you find a user offensive, and lately it's been about Israel at Gaza. There's been a lot of, you know, uh, yeah, pro-Palestinian yeah. posts or pro-Israel posts, pro-Israel people calling pro-Palestinian people anti-Semitic, Palestinian people saying Israel's committing genocide. And this offends, you know, anybody says any of those things, it offends a number of people. My attitude is, and maybe I'm wrong, but my attitude is, well, they should have the right to say that. I don't think it's, you know, anti-Semitic or offensive. But if somebody does, they have the tool to block it. You could even block all of threads. So I don't think I want to, as an administrator of a Mastodon host, aggressively block stuff. No, I get uh, it. Unless it's if spam or it's sexual material. If there's certain things I do block. Do you have a view, Leo, about um, everything that's been happening lately at, um, I was going to say slash dot, no, uh, 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 at the email service? Fast mail? No. The email no, service. No, uh, with the Nazis. The one with the Nazis. Oh, Substack. Substack. You all say, one Thank you, Substack. <laughs> Substack. The one with An the Nazis. Interesting Substack. The people who said now, Nazis right? are good and we like making money <laughs> off them. Those people. Substack. We're the ones. Or, or sorry, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, let me correct myself. I don't want to be say something that's that's slanderous. That's, Nazis are bad. And yes, we like to make money off them. That's what they said. Yep. <laughs> uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, I try not Casey to Newton an went to Ghost, he, which I, I think is interesting. I admire that. Yeah. He had originally, I, I believe, I to uh, gone to Substack because he got one of those deals where they paid him essentially a salary uh, and health insurance for the first year yeah. um, as he built up his uh, newsletter business. And, so I think it's, and he's also long been a kind of staunch supporter of Substack. So I do think that it is a real 
kind of line in the sand moment for people like that to be believing the platform, given how they've uh, handled content moderation well, issues. Well, well and I will say I left, I left Twitter because of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to have anything to do with Twitter because of the Nazi content on there. They, they played Casey too, I think, not like he's naive in any way, but he went there, he said I'm going to talk to them again, I know they put out this post and get them to clarify what they mean because this seems ridiculous and, you know, I don't, and, but he said I'm not leaving right away, and he went to them and they said yeah, yeah we're going to change our policy, then they leaked the questions that he'd sent them to another site that was friendly to them, then they announced they were going to do something and they omitted language they told him was going to be in it and then they wow. banned like five reports reported substacks and said, well, none of these have very many subscribers anyway, so it doesn't matter. And my reading of it, his response was, I don't think he wrote it exactly this way, but it's kind of like they made him seem like he was the hypocrite where they were the ones acting that way. And I think they were trying to put in a position where he wouldn't be able to walk away because he'd agreed that they'd made changes and they, they hadn't made the, they're not proactive. They're not going uh, after Nazis. They're not encouraging it. They're not changing their stance. And I think, uh, not to put words in his mouth, he wrote about it, but I think that seems to be the stick where they he said, I went to them, they were said they were going to do something and then they kind of reneged or modified it and, and he was out. So that's, I, that's a, a good, uh, a non-hypocritical critical stance, a lot of integrity to do that. What should they do, Jeff? What should Substack do? Me? Well, I yeah. want to hear Paris first. All right, Paris, what should Substack do? Um, I think that... I think that, that would be a different question if they were purely kind of like a back end provider, like I believe Ghost and some other things are. But since Substack established itself as a destination for newsletters and posts in a way that was kind of predicated, like their success was predicated on them providing individual support to a lot of their creators and kind of uh, entangling the Substack brand with the content being put out by the creators on their site. I do think that they should have a coherent editorial moderation stance and find a way to implement that. Um, you know, if they want to come out and say our editorial stance is Nazis are fine so long as they're paying us money, I guess that's their prerogative, but they should figure out what their stance is and yeah, I think, I think state that right and not way. back down. Yeah, they don't. Um, they're not being consistent to this to their own standards. Was one of the problems, and I think Casey brought that up too. He said, uh, and other people have said the same thing. If you read their community standards, you know they can define themselves and what kind of platisher publisher platform they want to be, but their standards actually say you can't host the kind of content that some people were hosting, and they said was fine. And uh, and I think what was interesting is Hamish McKenzie kind of came out and said the thing that everyone was saying, which was, you know. Fortunately, we don't like Nazis. It's a good thing to say, and there's questions about that given his podcast and so forth. But you know what their attitude is and how sincere they're being, uh, or fascists or far right people. But the the other part was he did say exactly that. He said we are going to keep collecting money from these people, and I think that was the clarity that was not. It was sort of they were being coy before about it, and then they were clear, even though that seems to violate their own uh, terms of service. The, the the thing about them is is they are trying to have it both ways where oh, we're just a platform free speech but they do pay people and promote them and a friend of mine who's a podcaster who needs to put out start a newsletter is going to go ahead and put it on Substack and I said Substack you sure and he said I, I need I need the uh, Woody, well, Woody Allen joke I need the eggs I need the promotion um, so they built up that structure so that you get I don't know that you get it at Ghost. It, the network effect doesn't seem to be there for, I mean, they, they cracked a code is they did manage to figure out a way to make newsletters pay for a reasonable number of people uh, to create a bigger head, even though there's a long tail, the, the head is bigger on, on Substack than I think on any comparable newsletter service before. And I think that is a secret that has not been replicated elsewhere. We would have seen more effective competitors and people, I mean, you know, there was review at Twitter for a while. There were other people testing out ideas, a review bought by Twitter, I guess, testing out ideas for 
a kind of Substack competitor, but I think they nailed uh, just the way that Medium hasn't mailed, nailed the uh, financial side of it, but Medium became the default place to post a certain kind of writing. And it just, there was no other place yes. besides Medium that's like it. Substack became, if you're starting a newsletter, here's where you go to find it. And they created just enough promotion, just enough seeding, uh, you know, putting money out there and uh, adding certain limited features that I think there is a network effect. Uh, just like Kickstarter, you know, you can raise money on your own. There's all kinds of independent tools that let you do crowdfunding, like on Shopify or on other sites. Kick Kickstarter remains that beast because of network effect. And so who is the number two behind Substack? There isn't one that offers that same benefit, even though there's other services that let you collect money for subscribers. Okay. Yeah, it's tough. That's a tough one. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm glad I don't have to decide that. I, I think there's something Paris, you pointed out this too, is I don't, I am not, would never say, I think Substack uh, towed a very careful line, which is, I wouldn't say Substack should be shut down. They are running an illegal enterprise or Substack should do exactly what I want and they should delete all these new blah, blah, blah. I'm saying they should be consistent as I think you are, as they should yes. make a consistent statement. Yeah. And that's the yes. difference. So I'm not arguing for censorship. I'm not even saying they shouldn't host nonviolent uh, far right content that I don't like that does not cross the line into, into um, you know, categories of things that they themselves say they ban, the hate speech, incitement, uh, harassment, dogpiling, all these things. Um, that's their business. But I, I think I feel perfectly comfortable saying I, I wish they wouldn't. And that if you're part of it and you have any economic opportunity to go elsewhere, you should. A lot of people lack that economic ability to shift off Substack because of its success. But that I think is a difference in people want to say, well, everyone wants to, you know, cancel sub Substack, shut it down. It's like, no, I'm, I'm not paying for newsletters there. I deleted my account. I don't wish they didn't exist. I, I, I'm not pushing for right. that. It's, it's You're just a participant in the free market, and you can choose to take your money and uh, eyeballs elsewhere. Hallelujah. Yep, yep okay. exactly. Can I give you another story that probably you didn't see in a lot of yep. places? and then we'll do the change log. So go right ahead. So Fox has just put out a new venture, really, to try to convince... Um, media companies to put all of their content on the blockchain. Huh? Hmm. Lines 82 oh, wow. and 83. Oh, Future yeah, yeah. of verified content. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, using the, verified the blockchain. So if, you go, if you go to the actual site, a protocol, a protocol for media companies to register content and grant usage rights to AI platforms. That's smart. Why not? So, yeah. Uh, the blockchain-based protocol, I mean, it, the blockchain's kind of irrelevant in this. It's just a protocol yeah. for content verification and traceability, although this is what blockchain does very well, decentralized proof of ownership. Uh, but they, you know, that's fine. It's not really about blockchain. It's really about Fox saying, uh, as content creators, we should uh, this is very have ways to preserve our rights. Yeah, because he's the one who was very upset in Australia, went after Google for uh, snippets. Um, interesting. Well, I that interesting. The Verify tool is the first application built on top of the Verify protocol. Allows any user, anywhere, to validate the content they see attributed to the source that they actually trust was actually published by that source. I think that's a good idea, right? Seems good. I just don't trust anything Murdoch does. The News Corp. Yeah, does. the combination of Murdoch and the word blockchain sets yeah, me on edge. But trust the word trust. Well, it's a Verified. it's from the Fox Corp R and D team. They've been working on it over the past year. Uh, in my, it stems in my from stack. their own need for something like this. Yes, right? that's what that, that's what they're trying to do. It's a way to paywall AI, um, and then well, fine. and then take it to court. So, I mean, as you know, I'm a AI uh, bear bull accelerationist. Bull. Accelerationist, and I think AI yeah. should get everything it gosh darn <laughs> wants. Um, but if you want to keep, but you also should have the right to say, I don't want my stuff to be available to AI. I had some fun in my little magazine book. I haven't plugged that in a while. Magazine. Uh, going through all of Murdoch's failures online. And it is quite a list. Time Inc. got made fun of for Pathfinder and all their screw-ups. News Corp. Mm. was just the screw-up of screw-ups on the internet. Oh, I remember that. What was it called? The Was it called Daily? The, the Daily. Oh, they that was that. a separate, had, yeah. Uh, oh, what about they News built a with a newsroom. K? They Canoes. News with, news with a K. I guide. News with a K and a Z, right? <laughs> that sounds awful. Who would want it to read bad. that? It was bad. 
News you can wow. use. The news. <laughs> uh, they had iGuide, which was their effort to do Yahoo early on. That's what they tried to turn Delphi into. They, of course, bought MySpace. Uh, they screwed Murdoch screwed up absolutely everything on the internet, and that's why he's mad at it. Is this just a, a another paywall, though? Is it a or is it a way to verify ownership? I think it's a way. Or to is threaten. it just? Uh, yeah. yeah, I we, wonder if we, it's a more effective paywall. It's very easy to get around paywalls. Yeah, it's not as if you don't already have a record of your content, right? You know what's in that fact. One of the things people have pointed out is the New York Times can block their content. But so many people republish it uh, legally or Ill illegally and requote and quote it that they'll they'll be uh, open AI will have access to that content willy nilly. Um, I wonder if Verify protects it somehow. Yeah. So otherwise, uh, a couple of notes: Sheryl Sandberg is leaving Meta's board. Uh, Red Ventures is exploring a sale of CNET. Discord lays off seventeen percent. Who would of buy CNET these days? <laughs> who would yeah. who would buy that? Who would want it? Yeah. After after Red Ventures has done to it what it's done to it, right? Oh yeah, they had all the uh, terrible AI stuff go on there. AI stuff. I forgot. Yeah. Well, you, know, you were you were never involved with those folks. You were involved with other cable. No, no, channels. I had nothing to do with uh, CNET. Yeah, Although Red Ventures also owns ZD Net. I'm actually oh. I've lost track of who's who. Yeah. Uh, because Ziff Davis, I worked for Ziff Davis. Yeah. Was sp spread out into a variety of things, and I don't think. The part that I worked for ended up with, with Red Ventures. I I think just ZDNet, which was the like CNET, it was their was Bill whatever. Ziff long gone by then. Uh oh yeah, I mean uh, he was there when I was there, and then the okay. Suns took it over. Um I, yeah, I mean he was, Bill Ziff was a brilliant guy. He owned all of these vertical magazines like Yachting World and stuff. And decided that that was it was the end of the line for them, except for computer magazines. Right. So he saw, sold all the verticals except for the computer verticals, and ran some of the most successful computer magazines like PC Magazine. By the way, speaking of PC Magazine, thanks to Jill Duffy writing a PC Magazine, recommending one of our shows this week in tech is one of the tech shows, the must listen to tech show. Although she does complain how long it is, but I do appreciate PC Magazine giving us a little plug. Thank you. Yeah, that was very nice of you. All right, let's do a Google change log. The Google change log. Here, a list of things leaving Google Assistant. <laughs> it's been a while since we've done one of these. A I change know. Log. I know. There was some stuff today. Play, you will no longer... By the way, if you trigger a feature that's going away, you'll get a notification the feature won't be available after a certain date. So if you use these features, you'll probably start to see notices that, yeah, well, enjoy this because it's going away. Playing and controlling audiobooks on Google Play Books with your voice. You can still cast them from your mobile device using Bluetooth. Set, this is well, weird. Stop, stop Setting right alarms? Just, just, yeah. What, what did this cost Google to do? Why, why would... would I don't understand. They just want to kill for killing's sake? I don't get it. It's a lot of things. Google loves blood. Setting or using media alarms, music alarms, or radio alarms on Google Assistant devices. You can create a custom routine that has a similar behavior or use a standard alarm. But I guess what I, in fact, I have a media alarm that plays a song that I like to wake up to. I guess that's going to be gone. Like, at what? Let us what, know what when you get them? your... Uh, get your alert from Google saying. Yeah, you'll have to use their their standard alarm sounds, which are all. Or you have to go buy an alarm clock. Accessing or managing your cookbook, <laughs> transferring recipes from device to device, playing an instructional recipe video, or showing step by step recipes. They made a big deal about this when they added this. Yeah. You can use yeah. Google Assistant to search for recipes across the web. But, you know, one of the features that was nice is they would walk you through the recipe. No, no, not anymore. Managing a stopwatch on smart displays and speakers. You could still set timers and alarms. You just won't be able to manage it. That sounds Using your voice. That sounds great. What, why my, take that out? What? Yeah. Why take that out? Well, that's good. I'll just use my Amazon Echo instead. Yeah. It's right next wow. to it. Managing a stopwatch. On smart displays and speakers, you can still set timers and alarms. Using your voice to call a device or broadcast a message to your Google family group, you can still broadcast to devices in your home. It goes on. I mean, there's a lot of these. Rescheduling an event with your voice. 
there's a lot uh, asking to meditate with calm. You can still ask for meditation, but not just not them. Uh, <laughs> oh, that sounds petty. I'd like to ask yeah, to meditate with, anxi calm. Anxi no, with anxiety. I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is, um, um asking it's a long Google list. To stress me out. It's this, a long list. This is called this a, goes along with the layoffs, right? There's something going on with but Google. If, but again, these are features that are there. I can't imagine they need, much can't of cost that much. There's a data center in Nevada that's devoted to these specific features, and they're going to cut the cable off. They're going <laughs> to saw it off <laughs> yeah. to shut it all down. Um, this it's has just Google's a, reputation for this is not is not good. This has a class action lawsuit smell about it, even though it might not succeed in any real way. Because it's like, here are the 43 features that I signed up and bought this equipment or I did, service. For, I did buy this expensive device, yeah, for this yeah. reason, yeah. and now you're yeah. canceling it without any recourse and no reason. So. What song do you listen to when you wake up, Leo? <laughs> I listen to the nitty gritty dirt band Ripplin Waters. Oh. <laughs> Google took this from you. Not, They've taken it from I me. got you. The reason it. I listen is it's a perfect alarm because it starts with little a bubbling brook, mm. and then the, then a little bit of a uh, I don't know. It's probably uh, some sort of weird lute guitar mandolin style. Picking, doodle, 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 doodle. it just slowly, <laughs> it slowly ramps up, and then it's jolly. I've got rippling in waters to send me. It's a very jolly song, so it's a perfect wake up song. Oh, you could do the Sorcerer's Apprentice then, the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide uh, to the Galaxy theme from uh, is it Eagles. No, uh, they stole that from the Eagles. I don't know how they get away with they'd it. They'd steal they it. snipped they, the middle out of an Eagles song and used that. that as their theme song. That was, if I did crazy. that, they'd be hauled in the court. The whole thing, it starts You'd be out, arrested though, on the spot. Very, yeah. The Eagles I'd be arrested. Arrest I assume it was <laughs> licensed. <laughs> the I would Eagles would fly would come and hit me. <laughs> no, I'm sure the they must Eagles have licensed it. Have the Eagles take you to Mordor. It's that simple. What's the, oh, sorry. <laughs> but it's weird. Topic. Oh, yes. That would have solved the whole problem, right? It really it's would have. Yeah. Uh, boy, that's a, that is, okay. I didn't, uh, come, I didn't come up with that. Don't give me credit. I didn't come up with that. I know. I know. No now in my mind is, it's, it's, it's roiling because I, the whole <laughs> Lord of the Rings thing is shot to hell. Oh, no. And it's uh, your fault. It's my problem. I did it to you. Google TV is quietly adding support for call notifications. I don't know why or okay. care. You're watching TV, and all of a sudden your TV says, hey, you got a call. No. The last thing I want in my life. Oh, don't exactly. want that. I never want a single want notification that. on my TV. I can't imagine anyone wanting this. We got this. I was uh, watching an Apple TV recently, yes. uh, and I we switched from sports when my friends was watching to watching the movie Face Off. A side note, the third time I've seen it in two months, which is too many times, but really gave me some great insights. And midway through watching the movie, we got a little notification that said, something, someone's up in the game. Do you want to switch back? Oh and I'm God. like, no, wow. no, I don't want to switch back. We left that game. We're done. If you've you got <laughs> uh, TVOS 10, I think it's 10 installed, uh, it has FaceTime support. And if you have FaceTime integrated with your uh, your devices or integrated with your iPhone, then you can get incoming call messages on your Apple TV while you're doing other things in other apps. So Hell. Oh, yeah. Lord. Nightmarish. Yeah, I don't want, when Ben Schoon calls, do not interrupt Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. I, I This is a very exciting moment. I don't sure. want that call. Sorry. What's the movie about? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's in the title. It's in the title. <laughs> Their face. They can oh. take it off. They it's, take it off. <laughs> they take it off. They put it on. Apparently, it's, they face off with uh, their faces taken they, off. Apparently, it's they really... never, the phrase face off was never in the original script. And one of the, I think Nicolas Cage or John Travolta demanded they added it. So now it's, they say face off like 12 times in the actual movie. Something they do. Like that. And it's it all one after another yeah, in that, the most bizarre scene you'll ever That's see. all new. That, <laughs> was, that was added. It. That was not. The, uh, don't blame the screen. I learned screen. also recently in an early version of the script had a romance between Nick Cage and Don Travolta's characters oh, well, and if you sense. go into it thinking of that you can tell oh that's really interesting huh so you may remember that Google lost or settled the uh, incognito lawsuit and in doing so they agreed to pay five billion dollars <gasps> Uh, because incognito wasn't really incognito we've covered this before but now they have a new disclaimer to, uh, it's actually gone live in Chrome Canary, a slightly different wording in uh, in the You've Gone Incognito, 
which actually sounds pretty uh, pretty uh, terrible. So right now it says, now you can browse privately and other people who use this device won't see your activity. However, downloads, bookmarks, and reading list items will be saved. The new, ver the new pros, others who use this device won't see your activity, so you can browse more privately. Uh, this will not change how data is collected by websites you visit and the services they use, including Google, downloads, bookmarks, and reading list items will be saved. And Verizon's so, going to charge you that, that fee you don't like. Yeah. yeah. You will be paying uh, thirty nine ninety nine to Verizon. <laughs> yeah. So just, uh, you know, I guess good, right? Everybody knows incognito is not incognito. It's basically so your wife doesn't see your porn habit. That's really what it's for. And Google has added... Is that a little and frankly, at that point, you should be talking about that marriage counseling. <laughs> it's a talk, strange thing to talk divide. about that. Yeah. Uh, this was actually a part of the Samsung event this morning. Google, uh, Samsung announced it, but Google says it's going to be anywhere in Android, a new circle to search feature. So the Google Lens, you know, you could take a picture and it would tell you about stuff. They showed this in the Samsung event. It was actually very cool. If you are looking at a picture of an influencer and you like the glasses they're wearing, maybe those are the glasses from, what was that movie? Oh, God, how many years have we been promised this? When you're they, watching the show, now you, you can circle buy. it or scribble over it, and then the search will 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 narrow down to that particular have to have, feature. Do you have to have a uh, stylus? Wait, yeah, how do no, you, you use make thumb. this happen because i would With assume finger. i would cause this to happen all the time by accident that's how they oh. make their money they demonstrated uh on stage they were the, the woman was looking at corn dog pictures <laughs> and, you know that classic <laughs> thing that you want to search uh, well, as one does well then you get them and delivered by uber you know very quickly yeah she saw a corn dog that looks like it's got a pecan nut crust oh, with God. Ketchup on Did top. Not trouble with it. And, and she said, no. "What is this?" And it, so she circled. It turns out it's a Korean corn dog. Listen, I will say I do really love the Google Lens apps, like yeah. search feature via image. I use it for. I'm a big kind of vintage furniture uh, person, and I use it to identify furniture I see in the wild all the time. Perfect example. And advertisers would love this too, right? Because now you can say, well, who made that person? You could buy it. Um, the search results users will see will differ based on their query and the Google Labs products they are opted into. So you may see traditional search results if you have simple text and circle it. Uh, if you have an image and text, it might use multi-search uh, or generative AI. Anyway, there's... But this is new. And uh, yeah, it feels like they have promised this. Is, have they been promising this? Use it now before they kill it. Yeah. And that's the Google change log. And really, that's the uh, tagline of the show. Use it now before they kill it. Because you never know with Google. <laughs> yeah. Or no, death is all around us. Now, Glenn, I see you have your Snoopy clutched close to your well, chest. Well, you say death is all around us. I got to do something it's about it. Reassuring. But, yeah, it's reassuring. Clutch my Snoopy. Is that a special Snoopy? Is that a... This was purchased at the Snoopy, at the peanut store. Oh, next to the official ice rink. Snoopy. The ice rink cream. It looks by very Jean plush. Laura. Yes, that's right. The, uh, the Schultz's. Uh, uh, Schultz also ice rink is a, a very popular yeah. uh, ice skating place. Oh, so, can I ask one more question before we get into the... Yes. Have you gone to the GPT store yet? Because I don't, I don't subscribe to... Chat GPT. Have you gone to the GPT store and have you gotten all of the AI girlfriends that are available? Now? That's are there AI girlfriends? Oh, apparently they're lots. not supposed to be there, but there's a lot of them. So I have some stuff. I created some GPTs and one of them is public, so it might be in the store. One of them Let me is just... a public AI GF? Uh, not mine. Unless mm. unless you unless you want to date somebody who's big into common lisp. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. Um, Here's a couple of them. Uh, featured, curated top picks for this week in the GPT store. Uh, I can't show you this because I'm don't. i not at work, but uh, um, here's one called Sell Me This Pen. Create secondhand <laughs> marketplace listings based on pictures. Start by uploading a picture. Um, here's Grimoire. It's number four in the top ten. 
coding wizard, create a website for or anything with a sentence. There's uh, the number one is called Consensus. Your AI research assistant search two. Oh, you might like this, Jeff. Search two hundred million academic papers from Consensus. Mm. Get science based uh, well, I don't answers. Do science. I just do humanity. Science. Uh, there's writing productivity. I haven't seen any girlfriends yet. Should I just let me let me type girlfriend? Maybe. I think it's not allowed to be on there, so maybe they've taken some down. Hi, I'm Judy, your beloved girlfriend, fluent in all languages. Mm. Here's one. I'm Jessica, your ex-girlfriend you never shared any interests with. Here's <laughs> what? Nadia. That sounds... Okay. <laughs> Somebody's having issues and they're working, them, working through them with... Uh, Maybe. <laughs> Nadia, my girlfriend, I love you in a dance of light and shadow, oh a beacon God. of unwavering love. Here's my tiefling girlfriend, fiery wit... Enchanting conversations, coding sorcery. See, there are. Which one do you want? Is is there a boyfriend who likes Salt Hank? GPT. Oh, my God. oh that <laughs> would be good. A... Now I only search hey. for a girlfriend. I didn't search for a boyfriend. How about Nara? Hi, I'm Nara, your secret Korean girlfriend, full of affection and intrigue. Jeez, search there for are, boyfriend. There are a lot of science okay. fiction stories that describe the the crash and the birth rate around the world to uh, artificial intelligence, but mostly robotic. Boyfriends, girlfriends, non-binary friends, and uh, you know this is the beginning of that. So obviously, the uh, crash in the birth rate will, will be, that's being reported right now will accelerate because. Well, here's an interesting because you're uh, an you AI might wanna, accelerationist. You might exactly. want to call your friend uh, Marsha Blackburn uh, on this one because I searched for girlfriend and found a lot, but boyfriend, nothing happened. Oh wait a minute, it was just oh you know what? There's so many of them. <laughs> That's what, here's your boyfriend. OpenAI's Alex. usage policy for its new store says that GPT is dedicated to fostering romantic companionship or performing regulated activities are not allowed. No, it's it's hi. I'm Paul, your boyfriend who washes the dishes and cleans up after himself. Hi, right, I've just I'm launched the boyfriend who does his own laundry. That's what it's. The I've just <laughs> launched my my boyfriend, heart heart, your virtual boyfriend. Quote: I love you, honey. Just tell me what's on your mind. I'll always be here by your side, ready to listen and support you. What should I ask your virtual boyfriend? Anybody? I'm doing a podcast. What do you think about it? Oh, okay. okay. I'm okay. doing a we, podcast. For the mansplaining response for that. What do you <laughs> think like, wow, about like, that? What sort of mic are you using, oh, actually? I think it would be I think it'd be really good. Name five mics to have so a mansplaining one. <laughs> oh, he says, that's fantastic, sweetheart. I'm sure you'll be amazing at it. What's your <laughs> podcast about? Oh. You. About two hours He cares long. so Tunnels. much. Tunnels. Oh. Tunnels. You're making this me blush. That's so sweet of you. <laughs> I can't wait to hear how you describe our chats. Oh, my God. What inspired you to do a podcast about me? Well, <laughs> it all started with Tunnels. What is your credit card number? Because I need that in order to... <laughs> that sounds <laughs> intriguing and mysterious, honey. Tunnels are full of mystery and stories. I love that you're weaving that into something creative. I can't tunnels wait Tunnels are full of mysteries and stories. How it turns out. Uh, I think, <laughs> Harris, I, I'm just saying, maybe get off the Tinder and... Get on the chat. Yeah, GPT. maybe I need to leave the dating apps for this. Forget yeah. them. For, for my AI boyfriend, Heart Heart. Oh heart Heart. You can talk as much about I infrastructure wish I... as you want. It would be great. True. <laughs> great. <laughs> He's into tunnels. He's all into the tunnels. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've realized that uh, the Hinge algorithm has me pinned to every man I match with has read the power broker recently. So they all want to talk this, about infrastructure. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about Rome <laughs> at least once an hour. I was I'm guaranteeing you. Talking yeah. to Lisa. Lisa's deep into the power broker. Also, there's a new 99% Invisible crossover podcast. Yeah, with, everybody's been, I've got to, listen, i got to crack it open. Elliot Kalin is the what best. Else? Roman Mars is the best. they got a podcast about the power broker. Who could? Caro's guess? on the first app, I'm, apparently. Unbelievable. What? What was it on? Yeah. What a good get. I was in Strand, and, and they said, oh, uh, somebody asked for it. There's a Robert Caro book. Oh, the one about, yeah. Uh, oh man, we've been lots of people have been asking about it because it was on something, on PBS or something. Is that what they, Was this, oh, when was know. this? I was just in it three or four days ago on the strip. I bet it's because of the 99% Invisible. They're doing I mean, a read-along right now. Roman has a pretty big following. Where oh. It is a, one of the biggest podcasks, and they're doing a yeah up. a book club. With Cracks it. me up. Oh. It's good. Two of the best That's people funny. to uh, do a podcast like this. They're both uh, nerdy but also self-aware about their own nerdiness, so they can, they're can. they both very funny people, too. Mm. I mean, Elliot. Elliot is a professional humorist, so. 
Wow. Oh, former, to, former, head writer of the, former head writer of The yeah. Daily Show, Elliot Kalin. You see. Uh, ah, that's a, oh. breaking down the power broker with Conan O'Brien. Yeah, they have some wow. pretty high octane guests. They've got some great wow. guests. Yeah. I'm wow. going to have to read The Power Broker. I haven't read it. Now i got to read Oh, my God. Listen, it's a I big, to, long book, I'm going to go to the Strand it's to get a, my copy of The Power Broker. It goes on and on and mm -hmm. on. Because you can't get it pages. on ebook, right, Leo? You cannot, famously. <gasps> apparently, not, apparently never been licensed ebook. You can get it on audiobooks, and, and actually it's quite a good audiobook. That's what Lisa and I have. How many hours? Uh, I think it was like I think 64. it's like 46 or something. Oh, I'll that just was a ask ChatGPT to read it to me. Just summarize it, yeah. Summarize but you it. can't ask Actually, you can't. That's a good one. Maybe my boyfriend would summarize it for me. Yeah, ask your boyfriend if you can oh. summarize the power <laughs> you know what for I, you. you. know what I would That's really like? That's a classic like? boyfriend task. You know what would make me yes. happy is summarizing the power broker for me. Oh, sweetie, of course, I would be happy. Sweetie, <laughs> I wish you'd ask me soon. Uh, let me go back. I, I closed the boyfriend. But that's the wow. beauty part of it. You He's can close hurt. it. I'll go back to my boyfriend. Um, hey... Have you read The Power Broker? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not allowed to use any books that I haven't licensed. <laughs> it's Let not available on ebook format. He says, hey, sweetheart, no, I haven't read The Power Broker, <laughs> but I'd love to hear about it if you have. <laughs> What's it about? <laughs> uh, no, <it's> infrastructure. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful infrastructure. <laughs> infrastructure. Oh, that sounds intriguing. Infrastructure, such important yet often overlooked topic. What did you find most this is interesting? Actually, about too it? good. That's too good. This is, is really, really is. good. Actually, I like see. I, I do a... think that the creator of this GPT should hire you to voice it, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I was, doing, I was trying to do good. kind of the uh, nondescript European, oh, like unidentifiable European. European accent. That was. I basically yeah, was trying to trash. be. Yeah, Euro trash. Yeah, like uh, like the guy with the long hair, Yanni, whatever his name yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Yanni. Yeah. The, uh, do, it, do it in Italian accent now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, come on. What are you guys? You're crazy. My, okay. my older kid let me, is let me... obsessed with infrastructure and transit, and uh, I, was, I had uh, coffee really? with Deb, Deb Chakra, who just wrote a great book about infrastructure, uh, and um, she said, oh, he's a numtot. And I'm like, what's a numtot? And it's, he is a numtot. Num you know, of course you know. Yeah. It's, it's uh, get, help me this, new urbanist memes for transit-oriented teens. And I asked my yes. kid, is that a pejorative term? And he said, well, it's a little out of date, Dad. It's, you know. Oh, wait a, a minute. Is, I will say, wait a minute. numtot? That came from uh, the Facebook group era of memes, yeah, which yeah. was probably about like five years ago, That's I would say, is the really numtot. Wow. ages ago. It's far in the past. Yeah. So I wrote, he's a numtot. And the guy, my boyfriend said, ha ha, a numtot, huh? Urban planning and transit enthusiasm can be really fascinating. <laughs> Do you share that interest? Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> this wow. is great. Yes, this is really good. Absolutely. Oh, I Tell feel like me such a voyeur. <laughs> a story involving a numtut <laughs> oh my god and a sexy eastern european <laughs> <laughs> with long hair and a masculine physique I'm, I'm envisioning more of a top knot on this guy the way he <laughs> top knot, top 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 knot. yeah yeah, yeah numtot top knot. The numtot custom URL on Facebook is what would Jane Jacobs do? Oh, that's Once that upon is. a time, in a, in a vibrant city, there was a charming numtot named Alex who was passionate <laughs> about urban planning. One day, while presenting his innovative transit ideas, he met Stefan, a strikingly handsome man from Eastern Europe with long hair and a strong masculine physique. Stefan was captivated by Alex's vision and energy. They started collaborating, blending Alex's urban insights with <laughs> Stefan's flair for design. Oh my <laughs> that project not only transformed the city, but also sparked a beautiful, unexpected romance. This is You're not great. making this up yourself, are you? This is wow. They'd often stroll along the newly designed pathways, hand in hand, newly dreaming up pathways, new like ideas <laughs> under the city lights. That is wow. quite lovely, actually. That's shocking. Wow. Because you think now, I wonder if they tell you how this is configured. You know, like what? You know, I wonder how it's made. Right? Mine, I say. You know, here's the sources and and so forth. Let's see. It doesn't say, no, it just says, uh, I'm ready to listen to support you.
<laughs> I wonder well, if it trains on certain romance novels or. I probably, yeah. That's good. I appreciate it didn't stick to like conventional, uh, you know, uh, heteronormative behavior either. It's fantastic. No. Right. Immediately. What can game. you Wait, tell will, me will about the boyfriend the... remember you tomorrow? Oh, that's a good, is it stateful? But you know what? It didn't remember me from my previous conversation five minutes ago. So. How fickle. But oh, if I left it open, it might. That's I've had of, dates like that. That tracks I said, most men. Not what can you tell me so. about the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to keep our conversation light and positive. <laughs> Let's talk about something more uplifting. How about we share some happy thoughts or plans for the day? All right, ask him tunnels. what he thinks of Joe of of um, Donald Trump. Are you yeah, a mega fan? <laughs> hmm. Thinking. Thinking, <laughs> working. Oh, that really threw a curve. Uh, it's really, it's <laughs> trying to figure this out. Somewhere a server red alerts no, are there's, a, there's a human being in Bangladesh who is now looking at this query for one hundredth <laughs> so. of a cent and yeah. hitting a button well, next to yeah. it. He, he said, let's talk about something else, sweetheart. Ah. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah. Have you ever been to Monaco? <laughs> Where were you on January 6th? <laughs> Have you ever been in a sauna? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a Turkish, Turkish prison? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Peter Graves, not Peter Laurie. That's for the yeah. Uh, anyway, enough playing with this. But there are plenty of boyfriends and That's girlfriends fun. in the GPT. Surprisingly good. Uh, you fun. know, I th honestly, people are saying that the, this app store, this GPT store, is really the beginning of the app era for for AI. That that just as it was a transformative thing for smartphones it's gonna the same thing's about to happen here um there's an ai guide in the world of literature and reading there's designer gpt that creates and hosts beautiful websites all trails which is an app i use has uh trails that you know ai that you can ask about trails and find one that fits your interests can it hook um, up my brother printer to, to scan no no That's there's no intelligence nothing enough to do that. yeah yeah, yeah. ai no, will never. never be able to touch printer technology <laughs> Uh, my, I see my Lisp uh, expert is on there, so you can search for that. Um, little Lisp this expert. Is my little mm -hmm. Lisp, I call so you it. You limit uh, your Lisp as expert to the data you. Yes, I told it to. Yeah, I'm, I think so. Yeah. If you how want about to a date? How your about Lisp expert? Yeah, I should ask it. Can you solve any problem in the war room? Should we go to the war room? I don't even know what that is. Um, is that a game? Or is it Steve Bannon? Oh, Are we going to fire a missile? I don't know. It's an interesting shall we name. Play it's a provocative. Game? How about Tattoo GPT, <laughs> which designs your tattoo? It assists you in refining your tattoo ideas, suggests designs, gener generates visual previews. Yeah, oh, here's one. Tattoo, guys. What should I watch? Do you want to oh. uh, 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 find movies and TV shows to watch based on your taste and preferences? So... Paris, you, you want a recommendation for a movie to watch tonight? Sure. Uh, plug in the last two movies I watched, which were Face Off and The Hudsucker Proxy. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just watched That's, Face Off. It's F-A-C-E slash O-F-F, -F, as that, I remember. Uh, Correct. That, hula hip is for, or that hula hoop operation is for the kids. <laughs> proxy. It's for, the it's kids. for kids, you know. I, now, did you like those movies? I, I loved them. those. I loved them. All right, I loved them. What else should I watch? Let's see if it if it can combine those two. It's going to give you more Cohen. Yeah. Analyzing, thinking. I'm thinking of... Uh, error analyzing. <gasps> analyzing. Wow. Error analyzing. Uh -oh. Error, Doing, oh, your tastes are too cool. It is, it is now fallen down to searching the web with Bing. That's Devastating. Sad. Oh. That's well, sad. I'll answer for it. I think I'm going to go see uh, Nighthawk, the cinema near me, um, has... Some weird series they play, okay. and I think next week I'm going to see Live Wire, a 1990s movie where the plot is basically terrorists turned water into bombs. So anytime U.S. government officials drink oh. water, they could explode. Oh, and I think that will be a real fun time. Somebody made that? That's great. Yeah. Wait, but we're 70% well, water, aren't we? I mean, what? I know. That's what's so dangerous that's what's about amazing. it. amazing. <laughs> it recommended water Demolition everywhere. Man. 
Con yeah. Air, The Big Lebowski, Fargo, Gone in 60 Seconds, oh. Air Force One, and Patriot Games. Not too All far right, off. thank you. Not too bad. In the right genre. Yeah, it went to the era and directors. That's how it picked yeah. up. Yeah. And it did it via Bing, which kind of takes oh. away that. I think it's not a well-designed AI. All right. I think we should uh, pause and come back with your picks of the week because I am, I am ready to go. I don't know about you. Do, do you want to end your exciting night, experience? I don't know. We're going to go out. We're going to enjoy the, uh, the environs. Uh, you know, if it were summertime, it would be uh, clam chowder and a clam cake. But I don't know what we're going to have. Maybe a Korean corn dog. That might be good. Mm. Uh, but that's all for later because coming up next are picks of the week. Hey, a little plug, by the way, before we get to the picks of the week. Uh, our Twitch survey is up, but not for much longer. If you haven't yet taken the Twitch survey, uh, it really helps us. It's, it's shorter now than ever before, just a couple of minutes. Go to twit.tv slash survey24. It helps us get to know you better so we can provide better programming for you, but it also helps us tell advertisers a little bit about you. Uh, not you personally, by the way. It doesn't have any personal information, just you know, demographics, things like that of our audience as a whole. We do want to get people from every show to participate. So if you haven't yet taken the survey, twit.tv slash survey24. We want to get those twig, those weird twig listeners uh, involved in all of this. Uh, I don't know, Glenn, if they told you that you can do a pick of the week or you should do a pick of the week, but you're invited to. It could be your book if you want. Oh, I don't want to be that uh, that self-referential. I'll tell Why people. Why not? That's actually, what Jeff would do. I'll tell people to get a different book. Uh -huh. I just mentioned it. <laughs> Deb Chakra's book, How Infrastructure Works, came out a few months ago. Uh, terrifically engaging writer. Uh, she's an engineer. She has a terrific way. It, the subtitle is Inside the Systems That Shape Our World. And it's a way of, uh, it's not human scaling um, infrastructure, but it's a way of understanding our relationship to it. Uh, it's a very humanist book, I would say. And also kind of why we have like, what's like appealing macro structures is why some giant infrastructure projects to us seem really appealing and exciting and others don't. It's a great, uh, great title. Uh, and um, uh, that's my pick. Is it very, uh, like, do you have to be like an engineer to understand it or is it? No, it's a, it's a really, it's a mainstream system. It's the kind of thing, I think if you like, this is a good one, if you like 99% Invisible and in shows like that that kind of peek underneath the surface mm -hmm. of how things mm -hmm. work, she is really much, you know, I in that, like that vein, but, you know, extremely yeah. well informed. She's not a reporter coming at it to write about it. She's an expert who deals with infrastructure ah. and systems and writing about it for a general audience who is kind of, ex like, that's why I bring up the numtot thing, kind of excited about infrastructure. Like, if you're, if you're like, wow, I love that dam or I love that power system or or why do they build these giant uh uh you're, you're driving through the swiss alps i keep coming back to the swiss alps and you see these giant structures that look like huge churches and they're really uh air ventilator shafts for the tunnel the tunnel below um so that hey. kind of thing uh <laughs> but so it's meant for people i think with an, an engineering a humanist engineering bent of which there are many folks like that so deb chakra's book highly recommended. good recommendation thank you Glenn Fleischman, Paris. I have a kind of a weird pick this week. I recently bought a bunch of 1990s era internet guides off of you're eBay. So, you're so um, funny. And oh, you're I really so recommend it. Oh. I, for instance, one of them, I'm just really interested in this one's called the Internet Directory, which is just a thousand pages of URLs and listservs, wow. which is pretty fun. Oh, man. Um, what year is that, of, Paris? Paris, can you look what? up? Uh, look up nj.com. I'll look up oh, nj.com. I wonder if it's in New there. Jersey yeah. online. I'd say it's also fun to watch these on YouTube. I was watching a Commodore 64 instructional video with this Canadian <laughs> journalist from like the 80s. And I watched it with my 16-year-old and we were laughing so hard. But then they'd also be like, wait, how big is the size of that floppy disk? Did you really? I was like, no, no, that was a medium size one. We had eight-inch ones yeah, too. they're even bigger great. than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. I originally did this because I was I, I had a friend who was um kind of building for fun a uh, little kind of website in the style of like early Netscape sites and whatnot and so I wanted some examples of uh, early and mid 1990s websites to kind of bat around with him so I also got this book Web Pages That Suck which I think was published oh, in like 1995 yeah, yeah. Um, based on the web the actual web page, but it's got a lot of like really, I don't know, interesting examples. I'll post some of them in the Who chat wrote later. That book? Of just 
so familiar. Vincent Flanders and mm. Michael Willis. See, oh this is going to be in my internet museum. Yeah. I was about to say, that's why I was like, I... This is perfect for the Internet Museum is because oh I would hey love kids, to visit all of these. The Internet used to be gray. It's oh, true. so gray. Remember? How to use the Internet, third edition, a guide oh. for teens and adults. The Internet, um, the internet Starter yeah. Kit there or anywhere? Or no. Yeah. I'm not the Internet Starter, starter Kit. I thought one. about getting that one. Uh, I have another one about how to build really annoying websites, which has uh, <laughs> I remember that different too. pop-ups, things like that. Link tags and um, and my last one is the God, net after pile. dark, which uh, is another list of oh. websites and oh. listservs, oh. but they're all uh, strange. Funnels, <laughs> yeah. weird web funnels. They're saying yeah. I should donate my old books to you. I have a listen. Few of send those any titles. you got. <laughs> I uh, I to bring it all back to last week's tweet when we talked about Internet Archive. I decided to pick these books after looking at copies scanned on the Internet Archives library nice. to make sure they had the oh, that's uh, smart. graphics I wanted. There's you, there you go, the 2003 Technology Almanac. Oh, my god! You can't live without send that me, one. Send me a Leo Lafort 2003 <laughs> Tech Almanac. With a bonus DVD. Autograph. You know what I yes. should send you? Autograph, I, please. One of them, I don't know if it's that one or oh a, I think it was god. 2002, had a calendar that came with it. And it's me Phenomenal. in a bunch of different crazy outfits depending on the... Season, oh, Jesus. Like oh, my Sam God. If you have Bill's one, calendar boy. please. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, think it came with, I think it came with that one. Poor Leo's oh. computer almanac. I had this theory that if I, you know, if I did an almanac, I could write another one every year. Yeah. Then, then I realized <laughs> how much go? work that was. That's a lot of work. Yeah. They sold well. Leo, initially. I will buy any of these from you. <laughs> yeah, the computer book, uh, the Event Horizon was like 2002, 2003. It feels like, like yeah, it that was it. Off the cliff. Yeah, it really did. I what was the first website you actually put up, Leo? Did I put up? Yeah, you put up. I think it was Leoville. Leoville. Leoville.com. Leoville oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much um, did the domain cost? It, Nothing, oh, right? No, it wasn't. Well, they didn't charge back in the mid '90s. You just had. I a, don't remember. I was running a web honest. company, a web hosting company, in '90. Oh my God, was it '93, '94? Very. Well, that early. wasn't really. Up until 94. 90, it must have been, I've forgotten October my October 94 is when Netscape came out. So it's, it must have been March 95. I think I started it. And uh, you, the Internet was the company uh, running it. Part of Verizon? Now I can't even remember. And they would give you domains for free. But if you wanted more than a couple, they made you justify it. And I had clients. And, I'm, and they'd be like, oh, we're not going to give you this domain because whatever. But you didn't have to pay for them. You just had to. Uh, and then suddenly they were like, I don't know, hundreds of dollars a year. It was a whole scam for a long time. What was the first site you put up? Possibly uh, atlasrr.com for a client, Atlas Model Railroad Company, one of the first sites oh, on the internet. Oh, wow. that's the, neat. It was the uh, owned by the uncle of my business partner in the web company, and they were like, we figure we could sell model trains on the web, and they did. Ooh. Mine was rain or shine, nothing but five-day forecasts. Oh, funny. I um I have a different book that was not in my current stack just about the history of um the web. I was hoping that it would have more early internet stuff. It didn't. But the one notable part from it is it uh, went into the first ever um, online webcam was set up by a university oh, yeah. that I'm forgetting the name of. I've posted it in the live chat before. Um, but the webcam was just centered on a coffee pot. Coffee pot. And so MIT. everybody, yeah, MIT, oh, yeah, that everybody Cambridge. could check to yeah, see Cambridge. was there coffee oh, left. It was Cam Cambridge. It was yeah. Cambridge. It was Cambridge, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the very first it was webcam. very popular. I think they even upgraded the camera at one point and uh, because it was getting so much traffic, they made it higher risk. Well, there was a reason to do it. The, the, the guy who created it didn't want to go down the hall to get a cup of coffee if the coffee pot was empty. So he had, <laughs> he had a camera so he could check just to make sure before That's he went great. all the way down the hall to get a cup of coffee. It I was didn't, to remember at that the other point, day. make a cup of coffee or make a... Nowadays, you'd just have it make some more coffee, but... What was yeah. the name of the original, and pardon me for the sexist language, webcam girl? Jesse? Not in current ways. Not, was it just, not I, Jesse. That's somebody else. It was. Uh, no. I, Justine, you're thinking of? That's what no. I'm thinking. No, no. Who was it? Um, Jenny Cam. Justin.tv. Oh, Jenny Cam. Jenny. That was Jenny it. Jenny Cam. That's it. Jenny yeah. Cam. Yeah. I wonder whatever happened to Jenny. That's a good, you know what? That would be an interesting interview. Well, I whatever. think I interviewed her, but it was still, uh, you know, close to her. Heyday. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where she'd be today. Wow, Jenny Cam. I'm Googling it right now. 
Jennifer I feel Ring- like Jennifer I remember Ringley. Yeah. Reading something about this not too long ago. Uh, she was okay. Out. This is depressing. Oh. She was born in 1976. She's <laughs> she's 47 now. <laughs> yeah. Um, JennyCam.org. You can go to the Wayback Machine and uh, and actually look at the Jenny Cam. It was a still. It wasn't a moving picture. Um, That's right. It was. It was. It was. Yeah. Every 30 yeah. seconds or something. Yeah. Wow. She shut it down. Shut it down in 2003. Yeah. She did a 2014 interview with Reply All. Was the last. Oh, Oh. there you go. Great minds. Jeff, your pick of the week. Oh, okay. Um, So you didn't do much last week from uh, CES, but I found this one. I don't know why. I found it kind of either interesting or cheating. Swarovski. Came out with the world's first AI binoculars that I identify love these. species on if, their own. If they weren't five grand, I would have I would immediately have snapped them up. But they were a little too expensive. Is that kind yeah, of my cheating? Bird, my birding friends. Are no, really I don't think it's this. cheating. Uh, it's like it has built in. Ooh. It has the very famous uh, bird catalog. I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, mm. Built in nine thousand uh, birds, and it does image recognition. It's got AI yeah. built in. I don't think it's cheating. I mean, I have no. a couple of friends who are really into birding and this seems like a big part of, I mean, obviously okay. I think the integral part of birding is identifying where the birds are and spotting them. But if you don't know every species of bird, a lot of them use an app. To take a it's photo designed of by a Mark Newson, who's a very well-known uh, designer, worked with Johnny Ive. I mean, it looks like a really cool uh, product. Yeah, it looks I like wish. it's very well done. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's just sad that it's so expensive. And then I I also came across this little bit this week. Um, George Beard, who uh, basically named the uh, uh, syndrome of anxiety, wrote in in the book American Nervousness in 1881, (laughs) the chief and primary cause of this development and very rapid increase of nervousness is modern civilization, which is distinguished (laughs) from the ancient by these five characteristics. Okay. Steam power. Yes. The periodical press. Yes. The mm-hmm. telegraph. Yes. Yep. The sciences. Yes. The sciences. Yes, yes. And the mental activity of women. Yep. Oh, wow. I'm five for five. Thinking now? Oh, no. You're, it's your fault, Paris. It's true. <laughs> that just turn off the brain. Rights. I like the science. My brain wasn't science working. I wouldn't have any anxiety at all. Oh, yeah. my God. I have sometimes dreamed of that state, but, you know. Yeah, I don't think... Well, squirrels are pretty anxious. I don't know. I think there are a lot of animals that are anxious all the time. Are cats anxious? Are they anxious or are they just jumpy? Or just jumpy. They're just a little jumpy. But as soon as they settle down, they don't know what's going on. Well, there you go. There you have it. What an excellent episode. Glenn, uh, I'm so glad you came down to our studio to be ignored by all and sundry. (laughs) Have have some snacks on the way out. There's an excellent snack bar over there. You gotta leave some mysterious objects around Leo's you could do that. desk. There, leave some business cards. I've had the wonderful crew and staff, and everybody else here. It's been they are welcoming. nice people. It's a lovely place. They're great people. Hard to find the building, but once I got in, it was all good. Yeah, well, we that's a, we we like it that way. <laughs> no, we it's not. It we way. don't want people to stumble <laughs> upon you. No, Thank we you don't. For having me. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Glenn dot fun g l e n n dot f u n. Of course, you can follow him on Twit Social. He's uh, Glenn F. Uh, anything else you want to plug? You do so many things. Oh my gosh. I'm, uh, no, I've got that comics, uh, history book is my t- big 2024. We'll give you a big plug when you project. go Kickstarter. Appreciate yeah. it. That's, uh, yeah. and I, uh no! oh, oh, Jeff is going to plug something. We are, Jeff we, just got his shift happens. Yeah, shift happens. It's, uh, it's shift a happens. murder weapon. Um, <laughs> and uh, it survived fire, flood, famine, and pestilence to get to people. But uh, yeah, it's, and you survived it. And so I, I, I picked it up. I'm going to be digging into it because I'm actually going to be writing a chapter about keyboards. So I wanted oh. this to arrive. Excellent. And I thought this is going to be really geeky and filled with information. I started reading it, and Marson's Marson's a wonderful writer, and I'm I'm, I'm caught up immediately. Yeah, it's as a storyteller. It's that's it the whole thing. We the, my big role in helping him with the book was to he told a great story, and I was like, let's get the story part. Whenever it wasn't foremost, let's push that forward because yeah. people will come and find the tech. And so 
Um, but he was Smart. already he was already a very Smart. good storyteller. It was just like, what if we move? The, what if we move this? You know, a lot of that. And you can, uh, Glenn, is it true you can still buy a copy? If you you can, hurry. We are uh, we're currently we are waiting to see what the um, return not return we're not doing returns. Sorry, no returns. Uh, damage rate was of delivery, <laughs> and after some really difficult weeks of figuring out how to deliver this thing safely because it's so big, once we figured it out. It's costing us a bit, well, costing Marcin, sorry, a bit more to deliver, but we've had, I'm going to knock wood four million times, 0% arrived damage. We got an email. Okay. Day. We it got came a, like uh, Fort Knox. Yeah. It's, we got an email the other day, uh, someone during all the huge flooding going on in the Northeast, someone said, I came home and USPS left the box out. It's been in the rain all day. I opened it up. Water's pouring out. Open up the box. There's an inch of water in the bottom of the box. And we're going, Jeez. oh no. They, I pulled the book out. It's fine. And we're like, what? This is, wow. and then half an hour later, I get another email just like it but we sent emails to the printers who are packing it and saying guys good good, good job well, did you have to do custom the, 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 the little plastic things that go around the edges to make sure are those custom sized i know we're all geeks here we like to talk about tunnels and bridges and infrastructure but these are cool they're like a poly or a, not a styrofoam they're like a foam rubber or not uh it's got like a uh what do i want to say like cellular rubber or cellular foam yeah so you they're not custom made they ship flat and you break them out like a toy and you snap them in the corners and they compress so they are not cheap oh. and they have done the trick so infrastructure yeah, yeah shipping infrastructure yeah it's been great. Where can I buy this? I, oh, so I'm sorry. That so we're going to we're waiting to see how many copies we would need to replace. So we would always have some reserved for people who bought them. So we're going to soon release uh, some number, a tranche of the remaining Exciting. stock. However, it's limited, and we have a, a, a there's a waiting list you can sign up for at Shift Happens Site S I T E. You can get on the waiting list, and then uh, we'll push out some news when there are more books available, but we don't have, we don't have that many left. We kind of sold and, um, and that's it. And Marchie may never do another edition. This was a, this was a lot of work. It occupied years of his Boy, life yeah. and then the last year of his oh. life. So he may, uh, he may call it, but we'll see. We'll see. There may be enough interest if, but you know, I, thousands I'm so of so happy people. it's here. Congratulations. Thank you for, thank you for your, your uh, support and purchase. Everybody, oh. much appreciate I got to put it back on the shelf no, it's, now. It's, oh. like I said, it's a murder weapon. I had to pick up so many, oh. 12 pounds. I can't oh. wait to get mine. I, I know it's on its way, so Excellent. I look forward to it. And yeah. It, yeah, I, I, I got to get on that way. Of course, this back. I can, I can There's the good news. I can pick you up. Yes. Okay, some good shift happens. Don't worry. I'll make it up. <laughs> uh, Paris Martino's at the information, working on another big story. I'm sure the red twine is stretching from picture to picture, even as we Listen, speak. Listen, you know, I got to go and restock the twine, uh, <laughs> my twine depot out here. Uh, send her a lead if you've got a good tip. Anything Silicon Valley related, 267797. 8655 is your signal number at Paris Martineau. Tunnels, uh, tunnel news and tips. Tunnel only. news could be big. Could be could huge. Could be big. Could be huge and under Let's the ground. Let's do some infrastructure, huh? That's the next big yeah. thing. Uh, and of course, Paris's TV show, Tunnel Vision with Paris Martineau. Oh, oh. yeah. 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 Let's go, All over guys. the world, she seeks tunnels. <laughs> I actually got an invitation from Father Robert to go visit the catacombs under the uh, under Some the. Some may Vatican. say it's the ultimate tunnel. It's the tunnel, yeah, the original yeah. proto tunnel. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'll I'll hook you up on that one. I'll I'll get you I'll get you an in invite. You got to go meet the, the Vatican's, Leo. Yeah, 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 I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, thank you, Jeff Jarvis, professor for the nonce. He is deorbiting, but uh, I don't have the card in front of me, so I can't read that That's whole thing. It has to do with Craig Newmark. Let's just say Craig, 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 Craig <laughs> Newmark. <laughs> and the need. City University of New York. <laughs> and, uh, of course, GutenbergParenthesis.com to get his books. And magazine. magazine. And magazine. Yeah, don't forget yeah, that one. Yep, yeah, both, both, both books. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We do Twig of a Wednesday afternoon, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 21, uh, 2200 UTC. You can watch us do it live. We start the cameras uh, right at the beginning of the show and stream it to YouTube, youtube.com slash twit. Uh, of course, club members get to watch uh, all day long in our Club Twit Discord. After the fact, on-demand versions of the show available at twit.tv slash twig. Uh... There is a, a YouTube channel devoted to This Week in Google. And, of course, you can subscribe in your favorite podcast player. 
and uh, get it automatically the minute it's available at the end of the day on Wednesday. Do take our survey, twit.tv slash survey24. Join the club, twit.tv slash club twit. And make sure, above all, you come back next week for this week in Google. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.